<laughs> Hello, happy holidays, and welcome to Tabletop Bellhop Live, episode 21, Hindsight Foresight. Coming to you from Hamilton, I'm Sean, and here with me, live and direct from Windsor, Ontario, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your game and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to say hi to everyone here in the lobby on Twitch. We're here live every Wednesday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. Even on Boxing Day. I want to wish everyone joining us a Merry Christmas. And for those of us listening at home, this episode drops on January 1st. So Happy New Year. We love hearing from our listeners and viewers. Each week, we hope to highlight some of that feedback, both positive and negative. We get better with your comments and suggestions. And if you'd like to let us know something about the show, send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com and or sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. Emmett O'Brien wrote me on uh, Google Plus last week, uh, about last week's episode, where we answered one of his questions, the one about printing large-scale RPG maps. Uh, he noted the following. Well, now I've got some maps to make. Actually, I just ordered a banner from Cafe Press. It's 28 by 42, if I remember correctly. I'll have to take a picture of it and share it when it comes in. Haven't seen that yet. Never fear, though. I have other maps I must print, so I will be checking these options out. Thanks. Oh, and these are way cheaper than Cafe Press. Well, thanks, Emmett. We did try to do what we can, but remember, some of these uh, deals we were finding were, were, very, very, were very variable uh, and seemed to change, you know, as, uh, as the minutes and hours passed. So uh, do shop around and check your email because if you leave something in your uh, cart, they do seem to get back to you and try and uh, encourage you yeah. to come in and buy some more. Now, Jerry L. Meyer checked out our post about the classic games workshop troll games. And he said, I have somewhere two of the flexi discs they used to put into White Dwarf. One had the blood for the Blood God song. Oh, wow. I, I remember as a kid having those flexible discs. I think I had some that came on cereal and some that came in, in a, like a wrestling magazine or something with one of the wrestlers theme songs. But I had no clue that White Dwarf and Games Workshop ever put out any of those. Now I've got something else to put on my wish list to track down along with uh, Troll in the Pantry, the one game I'm missing. Jens Finkelhauser had a quick comment about our kids game recommendations. Thanks for this, by the way. Our kid got the Haba game with the fruit trees. It's a huge hit. And I think that's Finkhauser, not Finkelhauser. Uh, oh, but, uh, I apologize. And that's, that's my very first orchard from the Haba, my very first game series. Thanks, Jens. Glad to hear our recommendations were working out. And uh, it seems like no one's uh, really going to complain about getting a Haba game. They're, they're just a strong yeah. recommendation for uh, their right age groups. Now, Ryan Peach had a comment about how you split the Canadian and, U and U.S. tabletop deals list on the webpage. He said, as a digital-only service, drive through RPG kind of exists in that space where the sales are friendly to Canadian shoppers as well. No shipping, no import fees or taxes. So... Not everyone knows I do this, though many of you probably do, but as one of my many concierge services I offer, I have a list of online tabletop gaming deals on the Tabletop Bellhop webpage. You'll see the link down at the bottom with all the master lists. Now, this list kept growing as we added new online vendors uh, over the last few months, and it got rather large, so we decided to split it into Canadian deals and U.S. deals. Now, while doing this, Anshi Games and I talked about potentially having some sites on both lists, like mainly sites that are in the U.S. that are Canadian friendly. But then we ended up in the long run deciding against it because basically any Canadian deal shopper is going to know which U.S. sites are good to buy for where they live, and they can just click on the U.S. link and go to those sites. Now, going specifically to drive through RPG, uh, I got to say they're only somewhat Canadian friendly. Because for one, all the prices are in U.S. And when you buy off them, you have the choice of using either PayPal or credit card. And unless you have a U.S. dollar credit card account or your PayPal is in U.S. funds, you're going to get dinged with the exchange rate. And if you're using credit card, you're also going to get dinged with a foreign currency exchange fee, which is usually double the exchange rate or at least an extra couple percentages. I know if I go to the bank, I get a way better exchange rate than if I buy something on my Visa or my MasterCard. Then there's also the fact that drive through RPG for a long time was PDF only and it was download links, but that's changing. They are now 
very much also a print on demand site. And once you're into printing, now you've got all your shipping, taxes, duty, customs, and brokerage of buying off any other US site. So while I know many Canadians who shop on Drive Through RPG, myself included, I wouldn't really call it Canadian friendly. And now, Tabletop Gaming Weekly, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last here. What games hit the Bellhops Tabletop? So every week, I like to take a look back at the games we played, any events we attended, and any other cool gaming stuff going on. You can catch the blog version of This Week in Review at TabletopBellhop.com. Uh, you would think with the holidays and everything going on, there's been a lot going on in my life recently, uh, it'd be another slow week. But surprisingly, it wasn't the case. We actually got in a lot of gaming since our last Tabletop Bellhop Weekly. With everyone shifting towards holiday breaks, people start making more time for meeting with friends and family. If you don't have too many family events, that can mean squeezing in some great gaming. Hey, and in some cases, your people you're gaming with are your family, so it works both ways. So Monday, we got two games off the pile of shame, something I haven't gotten to do nearly often enough and very seldom, say, in the last six months. It's been mostly playing games I already know. Just in time before the new holiday games add to the pile. <laughs> very true. Actually, at this point, I think I'm steps backwards. We got two off and a bunch went on. Yeah. So of those new games, uh, the first one was a game called Cypher. This is one of those tiny, small card games, very small card number games from uh, All Direct Entertainment Group or AEG. Uh, the ones that come in like basically dice bags, little small dice drawstring bags, games like uh, Love Letter, Lost Legacy, Empire Engine. I know there's a bunch of other ones. So very portable, uh, something to add maybe to our cafe gaming list. No, I agree. Definitely. These are these are perfect. That's why they come in the drawstring bag, right? They want you to just toss it in your purse, toss it in your back pocket. Uh, definitely easy to carry, small footprint, uh, small number of components. Uh, fairly solid games most of the time. So Cypher itself is a dystopian cyberpunk universe with some, the story is some big corporation just launched an AI and it's about to become sentient and the singularity is about to happen. So you, you're you trying to figure out if your players, factions, your mix of corporate suits, street-level hackers, and mid-level managers and crime bosses manage to control the Netflix. The so ne you've... Nexus. Not the Netflix. It's a, it's a totally different game. Trying to control the Nexus, which I guess is this singularity. Well, we could argue about whether Netflix will become the Nexus at some point, <laughs> that's but that's a, different, that's a different discussion. <laughs> Uh, but I, well, I'm, so I'm feeling a real cyberpunk meets the matrix. So you've got that, yeah. uh, that underground, uh, grittiness, but you've also got the AI overlords ready to uh, take over. Yeah, I totally agree. It, it, that, that's a good mesh. It fits well. So all of these little card games are based on love letter, which was the, the original big hit, right? Hugely popular game. It's up there, almost up there with Catan and ticket to ride for gateway games now, which is a card game that only uses 13 cards. Now, all of the games based on love letter have two rules that are in the same in every one I've tried. The basic rule is on your turn, you play a card from your hand and then you draw a new card. That's the basic mechanic. And then at the end of the game, the person with the most influence wins. And influence is a number that's on the cards. Now, Cypher, of course, has both these rules, but then twists things in some rather interesting ways. So not just a retheme or reskin of these games, but a new take on that game style. Yeah, exactly. Uh, there are a lot of Love Letter clones that are just Love Letter with new themes. Like you can get Adventure Time Love Letter, Batman Love Letter, um, the original love letter has a samurai theme. The one that came out over here has a medieval theme. There, there are definitely a lot of different ways to love letter in that. This is not just love letter with a cyberpunk theme. So the way these changes are is on your turn, instead of having one card in your hand, like in most of these, you're always going to start with three. And the cool part is you still play one. And then you still draw one, so you still have three cards. But then you have to decide what to do with those three cards. One you're going to keep, but the other ones you're going to give one to the player on your left and one to the player on your right. Now, you only have about 16 cards, I think it is. It's either 16 or 18 cards in the whole set. So there's a lot of memory here, trying to remember what you pass to other players. And the other thing that's unique in Cypher is normally in these games, when you play the card, it replaces the card you already have played. In this one, you're building a tableau. So like Race for the Galaxy or Splendor or any other tableau builder, you're putting down a whole bunch of cards. So you're build basically building your, your cyberpunk team, right? Your mix of corpse and... and uh, mid-level cards and 
street people and hackers and you're trying to put it together. So your influence is all your cards added together. Um, that makes the game to me much harder and more interesting than love letter because you have more cards going around and you're trying to remember what you pass to different people. And you know, if you pass to the person on your left, they're playing next and they could hit you with that card. There's a lot more going on there. So while again, you've only got 16 cards and it's basically a simplistic uh, concept, a simplistic uh, yeah. basic, you're building up a significant level of uh, difficulty just through the interaction of those cards. Yeah, exactly. And that's that's what it is, right? The the cards make the game. Like those basic mechanics are pretty simple, but then every single one of those cards does something different. And the way the game's set up because of the cyberpunk theme is there's three social classes. So you have lower class, middle class, and upper class people and um like cards. And when you play them, a lot of the interactions have to do with the classes. So you might play a low class hacker that eliminates the highest influence corp that's in play. Or you might the guy that has that corp might actually have played a mid-level bodyguard and that lets him protect his corporate guy and so on. It's the interactions between these cards that make it so interesting. You know, I, I always really enjoy games where you can discover these combos and chains to achieve so much more than each card individually allows. Mm -hmm. Very much. So. I, I, in a way, I think Magic was one of the big games to do that, right? Like the basic rules yeah. of Magic are pretty simple and everything's exception-based, right? Yeah. Exception-based gameplay. A lot of card games do that now. So we played this three-player. All three of us really liked it. Uh, it did take two plays. The first play, we were just like, I don't even know. There's all these cards. Once we started to see the cards and see the interactions, it definitely got better. Um, by the end of the second play, we were hooked. We played a third play just to confirm it. Um, it is a longer game. Like Love Letter is lightning quick. Actually, in Love Letter, I think you play like best of 15 or something crazy like that. It, or it's like the first person to win five games in a row. Whereas this was enough of a game in one play that I felt satisfied. Like, it didn't feel like we needed to play three times to feel like we played a full game, which is refreshing after many of these other small deck games are rapid fire, like play three cards. Oh, it's done. Right. I, uh, sometimes the nice it is to have a quick game of something. Uh, it just doesn't feel as much like you've accomplished something compared to a right. game that takes a little bit longer and has that little bit more meat to it. So moving on from Cypher up next was Warhammer Quest, the adventure card game. Uh, this is a one to four player cooperative card game set in the Warhammer universe, the good Warhammer universe, the old world, not that funky new age of Sigmar dude hanging on a comet being fined by a silver dragon. Uh, I think it was when we did um, our episode about uh, where I talked about Shadespire, we read off, Sir Sean read off some of the, the history for the new world and get him out. We kind of laughed at it. But, but this is back when chaos was encroaching and we didn't have to worry about silly multiverse Aspects. Yes, very true. One one world only. We didn't yeah. have to worry about all these factions and people coming back to life. And I don't even know. So we played four players, so max player count, divided up the characters. The characters are very um, iconic Warhammer races and, and, and basically like the standard careers, being the proper Warhammer term, I guess, for those races. So you had your, your Wood Elf Way Watcher, your Dwarf Iron Breaker, a Human Warrior Priest of Sigmar, and a Bright Wizard. And Bright Wizards and Warhammer are basically your Fireball, your, your flashy flame wizards. I, I must say I am disappointed in the lack of a rogue in that party, speaking from experience. Yeah, yeah. I got, unfortunately, rogues kind of disappeared from the Warhammer world. Like, they still exist they in do. the role-playing game, but they're not really... You don't see them on the battlefield, right? So as they pushed more towards the miniature game, they kind of faded rogues out of the Warhammer background. I can't think oh. of... Unfortunately, I can't think of an iconic rogue anymore without going to, like, the traditional rat catcher with the three-legged dog. Thardon, Thardon was was the one. That's it. That's He would live yeah, on in me that, as the, the great only rogue. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> So we played through the very quick and simple intro scenario. This teaches the basic mechanics, which were surprisingly simple. You put out a location card. You put out some random baddies. Baddies are either engaged with one of the characters or hiding in the shadows, which was a neat mechanic. Uh, each player in turn picks one of four actions. The actions are really simple. Attack, aid, rest, or explore. Simple, to the point. No real decision paralysis involved. No, not at all. Um... When you pick your mechanic or your your action, you're going to roll some dice. Uh, this reminds me of the fantasy role-playing game and the other fantasy flight games like the Star Wars one where you have good and bad dice. So you get good white dice for your action card, 
and for every enemy engaged with you, you take a, blad, a bad black die. And then you're going to roll those. Uh, they're going to tell you how many successes you get. There's a couple symbols that cancel each other out on the good and the bad guy dice. And then if there's any bad guy symbols left over, the bad guy counterattacks after you take your, your action. Very classic GW mechanics, you know, all the way back, Blood Bowl dice. Yep. You know, just pretty dice that, that you roll and see how they match up against someone else. No surprises. Yeah, very very popular. I find they work really well. I know some people can't stand custom dice. If you don't like custom dice, stay away from this one. So after you do your action, these are on cards. There's four cards. You tap the card. Sorry, you shouldn't use the term tap. Wizard of the Coast owns that. You exhaust the card, whatever. You tap it. Um, now what's neat is those cards stay tapped and they can't be used again. Except each of the four characters has one action that's called the refresh action that untaps all the cards. And what's neat is each of the four characters, it's a different action that does it. So I played the Sigmarite uh, Warrior Priest. And for me, it was when I rested. Whenever I rested and healed the party, I got to untap all my cards. But the Elf Way Watcher, it was actually their attack action. So whenever they attack, they got to untap all their cards. So it's a kind of neat um, action management system on how many of your actions do you want to pull off before you refresh. Right. And it keeps each character feeling different and avoiding that whole, these are just cookie cutter ideas. You know, they're yeah. not, they, they have a different picture, but it's the same character. Yeah. When, there was even more differentiation than that too. It was more asymmetrical where everyone's power was actually different. So as the Sigmarite guy, like when I attacked, I could move a mob to engage me. So I could like get that Skaven out of the shadows and have him attack me. Whereas the elf, when they attacked, could push someone into the shadows and then shoot at them. And then the dwarf had a thing where she could like summon all the bad guys around her because she could take tons of damage. It was neat. Like that, like not everyone's attack card was the same. They were actually all unique. Just little minor tweaks that made everyone unique. So after everyone goes, everyone takes one action, the monsters go. There's an AI. This is well done. It's just a list of things they do in order. So it'll say stuff like um, advance, then they're going to – I forget the word for attack. I'll say strike. I don't think that was it. And then they're going to do something else. And it, this really brought out the Warhammer theme. Uh, I found that really well done. So like the orcs always charged in and advanced, whereas the Skaven would attack and then move into the shadows. There were other Skaven that would hide in the shadows and then go deeper into the shadows and fire at you. And it was really well done to give the feel of the different Warhammer creatures through this like programmed AI. So this is a way that the Warhammer lover isn't going to complain that it doesn't feel like Warhammer just because it's random actions on the bad guys. They've actually, you know, worked with it, worked with the concepts of the enemies to give them that feel of their actions the way a Warhammer uh, enemy would. Yeah. Very true. Uh, what's neat, too, is like even just like not all Skaven, they had multiple different types, right? You had the Giselle teams and you had the gutter runners and they all each acted differently. So it wasn't even just like it's a Skaven. It's going to do this. Um, so then after the mobs do their thing, you interact with the location. So there's a card showing where you're at. So in the first mission, this is a room full of webs. And all it does is a really simple mechanic. The lead character has to exhaust tap one of their cards. Then it goes back to the heroes. So you've got environmental you know, damage as well as, yep. uh, yeah. as well as fighting monsters. Yeah, right. definitely. Um, so th that was it. Like you, the the intro mission was you had to explore the location you're at, and you had to kill all the enemies. And the explorer actions will let you go deeper into the the location cards. And it's just a matter of rolling dice, putting counters, and so on. I don't want to get into the pure mechanics. So once we beat the intro mission, which literally took probably under half an hour we tried the actual campaign so what this does is it adds a location deck so multiple location cards you have to explore through and then it also adds a perilous phase which is after each location encounter you move a counter on a progress tracker and basically bad things happen depending on the scenario so one of them was hilarious because there was this crazy goblin who just kept showing up. We would beat him and he'd go hide. And then when the progress tracker came far enough, he showed up and challenged us again. And the end mission was to go find his lair, go and beat him up there. But even then he ran away. And then also neat to theme, he comes back later in later adventures and becomes a recurring bad guy. I thought that was pretty amusing. Uh, there are some new added rules, but they're not much. Um, there's now rules for exploring new rooms because now you're going to explore a location. And when you leave, it spawns new monsters. It all makes sense. And then the cool part is the campaign mode has you go back to town between adventures where you can do things like go to the shop and buy gear and level up and you can replace your four basic actions with better ones. Great. Now, is there a progression of chaos that leads to your inevitable doom and the disruption of the world? 
I'm not in the scenarios we played, but it wouldn't surprise me if that was planned because that just seems to be the Warhammer thing. Right now, we were doing um, definitely Goblins and Skaven was the theme so far. There right. didn't seem to be much chaos. I don't know if that's something coming in the future or not. And actually, I'll have to say, we'll, I'll we'll jump get ahead to, a bit to say, no, it's not. <laughs> well, I was going to say, we'll get to that. But uh... yeah. So overall, we loved it. Now, like, I'll admit, we're like I'm a huge Warhammer fan, probably one of the biggest out there. I could still probably run Warhammer First Edition without a rule book. I ran that game for years. I was fully immersed in the rules. I've got tons of White Dwarves back there, and pretty much every game, Games Workshop published until about 1995. Um, the group I played with was my old Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay 3rd Edition group. So this is a group of players who played Warhammer 3rd Edition three years under me DMing. So they're also fans of the lore in the universe. But I admit, I gotta say, I have a feeling, I don't know because I'm so into Warhammer, maybe I'm blinded by chaos, but I think this would still be a very solid game without that theme. I think if you threw a different theme on it, it would really still shine. One of the things that really shines for that game is that aid action. So the aid action doesn't help you at all, but helps the other players. And the fact that because of the way things tap and untap, pretty much once around, everyone's going to use their aid action at some point. So the game almost forces you to cooperate. Plus, it's hard. Like, it's a co-op game, and co-op games should be hard. We, we had to work together. What's nice that I also liked is there was no hidden information. Because there's an awful lot of these co-op games that are like, you can't talk about the actual numbers on your cards, or you can't say exactly how much damage you're going to do, or you can't declare what your action is going to be. Even Gloomhaven suffers from this. And I get why they do it to increase the difficulty, but I like the fact Warhammer throws all that out. And you literally, your cards are open on the table. No one has a hand of cards. I can look over and see what everyone else has tapped and what they don't have tapped. And we can fully share information and actually plan properly. Well, you know, it's nice that you can design the game where you're allowed to share the information and mm -hmm. still have the difficulty. Uh, I, think, oh, yeah. I think telling players to not share the difficulty and using, uh, and, or not share information and using the difficulty as an excuse is to some degree, and I, I don't want to generalize too much, but to some degree, lazy gameplay. You know, you should yeah. be able to design the game so that the difficulty doesn't rely on your players hiding information uh, from, the, from the rest of their team. Uh, yeah, I love I love a game that requires team a co-op game that requires teamwork and not just allows it. Right. No, oh, I agree. And there are so many that don't allow it. Like that that whole you're not allowed to talk about your cards is such a common thing in cooperative board games. Yeah. Now, often it's in the ones with hidden traders, so it makes a little more sense in those. But I love that we didn't have to worry about that. Yeah. So now I noted we did the intro scenario. Uh, we ended up doing two missions in a row, so they weren't very long right because we had already played cypher three times and we played this three times really uh but now we have the big problem this is this is the the issue with the game and why i don't tell everyone to rush out and buy it right away is we're pretty much done there's not much left there are only three more missions in the campaign and then there's this delve style mission that you can play in non-campaign games that seems to be made for like you bring the game to the FLGS or your friends over for the weekend. So you want to show off the game, but you don't want the commitment of playing through a full campaign. So there's a delve mission. Once we finish those, that's it. It's done. There's no more. There is no chaos takes over the world. Uh, the problem is this game came out, I think, a month before Fantasy Flight and Games Workshop split and it became a dead game. At the time, there were two expansions in the works. Both were just dropped. Now, they did put out some print-on-demand stuff that some people out there have, and you can find on eBay or whatever at stupid prices, I got to say. But it's just more heroes. And, like, out of the two missions we played, like, I guess you could finish the campaign and try again and maybe try to do better, but you, you'll have seen it all before. Like, it's the problem with these campaign games. Now, it's no legacy game. You're not ripping anything up, and I guess you could go through again and try to buy different gear or level up different stats or whatever. Like, I guess there's a bit of replay value there, but personally, I can't see with the number of games I own and the number of games coming out wanting to repeat the experience. So this is sad, right? Like, this game was fantastic. This is one of the best co-op games I played, and it's dead. So, done game. Well, you know, it's never fun when the business environment is what destroys uh, what is a solid game. Uh, yeah. Games Workshop and Warhammer specifically have gone through a lot of business turmoil over the years. Mm -hmm. uh, and fans like you and I have, have been for many years, have really sort of suffered the perils of the business environment related to that. 
Yeah, and there's so many rumors. Like, I don't even know exactly what happened. Now, some of the other Games Workshop games did get picked up by other companies, like WizKids is putting out Fury of Dracula. So I guess there's a very, very small chance this might come out, but this is literally Warhammer, like the Warhammer license. So I think unless Games Workshop decides to put it out, it's not coming back. So later in the week, I think it was a Thursday. I think it was. I can't remember now. Uh, My wife and I had date night kind of out of the blue because Jack's, which is this fantastic gastro pub out in Kingsville, Ontario, um, must have had some bookings open close to the holidays and wanted to fill them up because they announced this like crazy deal. It was like 90 bucks for a room overnight and they give you a $50 gift voucher for the restaurant downstairs. So basically you get dinner, which you're paying for, but then you get a room for 40 bucks, which is insane. Like, uh, this is a nice room, right? Like, you're not staying at, at, at some dive hotel. This is basically almost like a bread and breakfast above the, the pub. So Thursday, we basically had an afternoon and night without mom and kids, which was awesome. So besides some great food and craft beer, we also got some games in. Now, I just want to make sure nobody gets the wrong idea. You guys both really love your kids, and both, <laughs> but you both work at home. So aside yeah. from school, there is a lot of awesome quality kid time uh, that, that means that, you know, when, the, when the time allows a date night without those kids is, is a special and, and rare experience, which is, which is why it comes up and why we talk about this getting rid of the kids thing. Uh, not for, for any lack of love or uh, enjoyment of the kids who are gamers in their own right. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't mean to sound flee, run, run, flee, hate my kids. No, <laughs> not the cat, not the case, not the case at all. So just looking back to our date night episode and some of the stuff we talked about, right? So, of course, I had to pack games before going. So my original plan was to leave early, hit a place called Spoon Ramen for lunch, drive to the CG realm and pick up something there, which I'll get to in a minute. We wanted to pick up pick up a card game and then drive to Kingsville and hit this awesome coffee shop ca- called um, Merley's and probably play some games there. But things just didn't go as planned due to the kids and the mom we were trying to run away from. And so we didn't get out there till pretty much dinner. So that kind of sucked. And dinner at Jack's, like Jack's a nice place. No complaint on Jack's, but it's a restaurant. It's not necessarily somewhere you're going to sit and play games at. A couple times we've gotten uh, a table and like there's like a back upstairs room that has some booths with big tables. And yes, we have played games on them. But we were just out in the main room at a small two-seater table. Uh, at this point, we're like, no, nah, this isn't going to work. But I remembered I had my iPod Touch on me, which I used for listening to podcasts on the way out. And that had a couple game apps on it. Check at the table saves the day. Some tables <laughs> just aren't made for gaming or the games that you have with you at the time. Uh, and uh, a little bit of tech goes a long way in uh, helping save the day. Yeah, I was glad we had it because at first I was like, huh, well, this isn't going to work much. Um, so our first game was I played, we played Star Realms. Uh, I got to admit, when I booted that game, it's been a long time since I played it. I don't know if it's my memory or they changed something or I just hadn't played on the iPod Touch, but I couldn't believe how small it was and how hard it was to control I'm going to pause for a sec. Sean, you are frozen. It's fixed again. It is fixed. Okay. I, I'm, I'm trying to keep an eye on it tonight. All right. I'm going to jump back. So first was Star Realms. Immediately shocked by how smart, small. I, I've lost my ability to talk now. So I booted Star Realms, and I was like, what the heck? This is way smaller and harder to control than I remember. Like, I don't know if it was because I was on my iPod Touch, which is here. It's tiny. It's much smaller than most smartphones. Um, or maybe I just, I don't know, maybe I just got older. But Or they changed something. One of the things I couldn't stand is Star Realms looks pretty because it looks like a virtual tabletop. And you've got this, like, star field. But all the cards are, like, I don't know how to describe it, flat, like, um, foreshortened, right? So they look right. like they're on a table and you're looking at them instead of being flat and looking at you. I got to admit, I would have preferred flat. Like, just give me the cards so I'm looking down on them and they're easy to read. Um, we also had a problem with the inter- the interface. Um, just forgetting, like, double tap, I think, in that one means play cards, whereas in Ascension, it's tap once to view cards. Or And I just, I don't know how many times I played a card I wanted to read and I read a card I wanted to play. And it, we fumbled. It, it was a little bit of a mess. Right. 
I, I you know, in my experience, even with my larger um, Pixel XL, uh, it's just not great for many card games. Uh, I always prefer a tablet uh, if I'm going to be playing uh, most tabletop games. Yeah, at this point, we would have to buy a new tablet. Like we have an old iPod or iPad but it's like an iPad 2 or something. And when they went to the retina screen and everything else, just all the old apps don't work, right? Like people yeah. worry about technology becoming obsolete. I will admit it's definitely a problem. There are an awful lot of apps that used to work great that somehow hit this one upgrade stage. And for some reason, instead of just letting you keep the old version and play with it, they force you to upgrade. And then all of a sudden it says this app no longer works on this device. Yeah. Thanks, Apple. At least Apple's famous for that. I don't know if Android has the same problem. I've yet to see it on Android, but I'm only a new as of last year Android user. So yeah, it, it it's, not gen long, you know? it's not generally as big a problem because uh, on Android, you end up with so many different manufacturers, that, the game supporters, which yeah. and, I, and I, I, it's bad for game supporters because they have to support all the different resolutions. Mm -hmm. Whereas on Apple, there's a very limited number of resolutions. And once Apple yes. stops caring, so does the developer. Yeah, which hurts. Um, overall, I got to say for Star Realms, I wished I brought my cards. Um, one of the things I love about Star Realms, it's 100% cards. You don't need counters, life trackers, everything. Everything's done with cards. Uh, though I got to admit on this table, it might have been rough because Star Realms, it's a deck builder, can take up quite a bit of room with the um, the purchase track and putting your cards down. Yep. So next we went from Star Realms after like we tried it. I think we played two games. We might have gave up after one. It just wasn't working for us. I then booted Ascension. Now this one also shocked me, but for a completely different reason. Sometime since the last time I played Ascension, they changed all the art. Every card, every single card has swapped art on it. And I don't know why or when this happened. We used to play Ascension a lot. And it was at the point where with at least the core set and I think the first two expansions, we had the cards memorized. Like I would look and go, oh, that's that snake card. I know what that does. That was gone. So, man, we spent so much time having to reread the cards and tap on everything. And I'm like, oh, okay, that's this card. Oh, okay, that's that one. Oh, that's that blue one that lets you draw two. That was a bit annoying. Yeah, I have to say, I was so relieved to, to see this in the, <laughs> in the show notes because I recently reinstalled it on my phone just as something to play. Uh, my wife and kids have pretty much taken over the tablet, so I don't ever see it anymore. Uh, and I reinstalled it and I was... The size was annoying to me, but it was something I, you know, I would play. And I, it wasn't just the size, it, it was the art. And I hadn't even realized it yeah. because it had been so long since I played it. Oh, it but it was, it was weird. And, and I realized now reading, reading yours, uh, yeah, the art was different. And that, that made a yeah. big difference. It's, all of it. Like every piece is different. The basic cards, the cards you drafted threw us off. Now, I got to admit, except for that quibble, I still love this app. Th this is the opposite of Star Realms. I would much rather play Ascension on the app than play my physical version. I've actually sold my physical version. I no longer own any copy of Ascension. Ascension just has too many bits. Like, there's two different types of counters, the yellow and the red crystals. There's the board. Um, depending on what expansions you have, there's lots of special decks. Like, if you're playing with the one, you have to have the encounter cards. There's the other one where you can change your creatures into other creatures, so you have to have that deck aside. Um, if you have the latest set, there's even dice now, I guess, in it. I don't know. I haven't really kept up. Um, then there's the fact that if you combine more than two sets, the deck is just huge. It's hard to stack. It's hard to shuffle. I've, as far as Ascension goes, I'm going to stick to the app. Please just give me the app. Yeah, and we talked about this when we were discussing your review on uh, on Dominion a while back. I, I honestly can't imagine playing Ascension physically. Uh, it's just... <laughs> It, it works so well. Um, all the different aspects of it are just so much easier to manage and handle on the uh, on the app. Yeah, I agree completely. I, I have played it physically still a couple times, but no, no reason to. So after dinner, we headed up to our room. We cleared off a table. Remember we talked about doing that date night, table, date night episode. You may want to ask to do that or just do like us. We made room. There was a nice big table in the room. Uh, and we got ready to play Keyforge for the first time. This is the hot new Richard Garfield game. Um, Richard Garfield being the guy most famous for Magic the Gathering. Personally, I love him for Robo Rally. Uh, this is the one with the procedurally generated decks where every single deck you buy is 100% unique and there's no other deck like it out there in the entire world. Now, this game is huge right now. Uh, yes. There's no deck building, no deck construction. Oh. You just buy your deck, 
and sit down with it. Yep, that's it. That's This is it. You buy this and you play. Um, due to the unique decks and the system, I really wanted to do an unboxing video before playing. And I got to say, we tried. I think it was the fourth or fifth take where we finally got it to actually record the whole thing and not lose connection and not say we were, what was it, going on a camping trip or something <laughs> silly? It kept setting the yeah. title to. Yeah. I don't even remember. It's not, it, it thought we were burgers out in Kingsville. I don't know. Whatever it was, it finally worked, and it looked good on my phone, and then I came home and saw it, and I was like, oh, my God, the quality is terrible. Um, I'm guessing Jack's Wi-Fi just is not good enough for live streaming, and I'm not sure why I even chanced it. I'm going to blame the craft beer. Yeah, it was so choppy that uh, I had been sitting at my computer the entire time, never got a single notification, and actually only discovered because I was joking with you on Twitter about how you, you'd mentioned playing it on Twitter, and I said, oh, what do you mean? You didn't do an unboxing? Uh, to which you responded, but we did. Yeah. Um, yes, we did. So uh, It's there. If you go to our Twitch videos, yeah. it'll be up for whatever 14 days. We don't plan on highlighting that one. I figure we'll leave it there. Why not? It doesn't hurt. But yeah, you, you can see our decks, and I think it might be in She Games' first video appearance. I think she's in that one, if you can tell between the blockiness. <laughs> Now, now, uh, Shadzar, now, Shadzar mentions it. He, th he thinks there might be one deck out there to beat all the other decks, and the person who gets that deck always wins. I don't think that's uh, a, a potential with this one. There's, there's enough uh, possibility that I think there could be a deck that works so well with someone that they become more or less successful. But if they went to a different town, there's a good chance that uh, they would no longer be the champion. Uh you know what? Remind me of that. I'll get to it once I okay. get through a bit more on the game because the, there is something in there that may help that. Right. So uh, when we went, we didn't have a core set. I just had actually at the start of the day, I had one set right here because someone asked me to unbox this live and it's still sealed because I didn't bring this one because I didn't know if the unboxing was going to work. So we stopped at the CG Realm, awesome local game store, and we're like, Dude, do you have a starter set? We want to buy a starter set because I know it comes with two decks in it and all the rules. And they're like, oh, no, no, we sold out. We can't keep it in stock, which is a common story everywhere. And I'm like, I'm like, oh, man, that sucks. He's like, no, no, just buy two decks. You don't need the starter set. Um, there's some counters in there, but you can make you, you can make do without the counters. And it doesn't even have the full rules. And they kept repeating this, that the rules for the game are not in the starter set, which I got to say is kind of, excuse me, I don't like that. We'll put it that way. Um but he assured me you can get the rules online. The only way to get the full rules is online. All we need are these two decks. Buy these and go. So we did. We bought the two things. And um, during dinner, mostly while waiting for our turns while we were playing the deck building games, we both read through the PDF for the rules. They weren't long. Uh, but a lot of the rules, this is weird too, a lot of the rules for reading a PDF are short stories and background info, which makes sense because I know Magic has a whole Planeswalker and lots yeah. of people are into That's, that's very Garfield. Thing. Yeah, I, I admit I haven't read it yet. I saw it. It was in the PDF. I just read the rules. Um, the other thing, though, is, holy cow, there are a lot of things. We were talking about too many tokens in Ascension. No, Keyforge has that beat. There are six key tokens that are two-sided that you need. You need Amber, A-E-M-B-E-R, because, you know, you couldn't just use the word Amber for your counters. You need a way to track Amber. You need a way to track damage on all of your different creatures. You need something called a chain track. And then there were two types of cards that you have to use to attach to your other cards, potentially. We didn't have any of that. So when we played, we used patchwork buttons for Aether. Uh, we also used those for health tokens. We used the uh, fives for the Aether, I think. And then we used the Zool tiles for keys. And well, it worked well enough, I guess. But I think I would have preferred actual counters. Well, it's always nice to have the right pieces. Uh, necessity is a mother of invention, and any good gamer is going to be able to whip up some tokens and uh, and make it work wherever they are in most cases. Yeah, I it, it, it worked. It, it wasn't great. I got to admit, I, I would have preferred having something a little better, yeah. especially like thankfully none of our decks had the things that needed the cards. I think that would have really made it difficult. So our first game went okay. Um, we were trying to figure out our decks and reading our cards. And what we kept finding was, man, our creatures died too quick. We'd play them, and they get wipe out, wiped out before we got to use them. And it felt kind of weird. I'm like, this is strange, I guess, compared to like people in Magic having tons of monsters up. Uh, the game seemed pretty quick. But once we finished, we're like, man, that I don't know. I felt odd. So we revealed the rules, and sure enough, we played 
Keyforge Extreme. Uh, which is not surprising, given the difficulty of not actually being able to hold a set of rules. That is true. All we had were our phones. Uh, so the biggest problem we had was we, we forgot what Yoda t- told us to do. We did not unlearn what we had learned. Uh, we were stuck thinking Richard Garfield magic, and there's attack and defense stats. And in our heads, we're like, well, if attacks higher than defense, you kill the target. And look at our decks after the game, we're like, man, it just seemed like everything died too quick. And I'm like, do you have any cards with any defense? And like, out of my entire deck, I had like two cards with one defense. And Angie Games, I think, had, had maybe two or three. But almost everything had zero defense. And I'm like, whoa, this doesn't make sense. Like, if you have zero defense, you're just going to die instantly. So we read through the rules again, and we realized that the key forward's card's power or attack strength is also its hit points. And what the fence does is reduces incoming damage by that amount. So if you're supposed to take six and you have a two defense, you only take four damage. So it's much more of a armor than defense stat. Right. So it's a, it's a damage sponge, not an actual defense, as everyone else seems to think about it. Uh, that's It's a small but yeah. rather vital difference. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It was a huge change. So we played again, and it was an entirely new experience, an entirely new, better experience. I've got to say it's a very interesting game. So the big mechanic in it that that kind of makes the game is every deck has three factions. And each turn you pick one of those factions, and then you can play any number of cards of that faction or use any number of cards of that faction that are on the table. So... There's no mana, there's no summoning cost. If the card's in your hand and you're playing the right faction, bang, you can play it. Um, what you're trying to do is get, gather that amber stuff, and then you're going to use the amber to unlock keys, and the first person to unlock three keys wins. Yeah, so you really, a lot of it is, uh, it's a simple concept, but uh, but not simple in the way of love letter or cipher. Um, yeah. Just, uh, you know, it's it's... It's it's simple enough to learn, but there are so many different combos and car and cards that yes. uh, it ramps up the difficulty in that manner really quickly. Yeah, and again, it's it's that same. It's exception based rules, right? Like those are the basic rules, and then every card's going to break those rules in some way. I don't think there was a single card that all it was was an attack and a defense value. Put it down, play. Everything had some text on it. Now I got to say, this is definitely not magic. It didn't even feel like magic, except for the fact that I had cards and I had creatures. I guess. There's no attacking each other. It's just your forces versus the other. Your creatures are all out there to either generate or steal amber. They're not even there to try to kill anything else. Um, Wiping out the opponent's creatures may or may not be a good strategy. Um, What was neat to see, and which is what I expected from the game, to be honest, was how different the two decks were. Um, Mine was all about wiping everything off the board and doing tons of damage and gaining aether for attacking and for killing things. Now, I also had a selection of cards for Stealing Amber. Now, Angie Games' deck was all about getting as many Martians out on the board as possible and using this thing called your archives, where you can remove cards from the game and then bring them back later. Hers deck seemed way trickier than mine. Mine was pretty much brute force, pretty simple, where hers seemed to, there seemed to be some tricks that she was picking up after the second game. Right, so a lot of it, so I mean, this game, in, in its essence, is really... When you get a deck, you need to learn your deck and play that yeah. deck. You don't get to play that deck your way. You play its way. Uh, it's, yeah, it's pretty much... I, I could say. I, like, I'm sure there's some room that decks can be played differently. Like, I think different players would play a different deck differently. But there probably is a way to play a deck optimally. Right. And that's the, the one thing. Uh, the, my first experience was good. It's, it's a solid game. But what I get out of it is the desire to buy more decks. I now get it. There was no deck building. And I got to admit, we wanted to, right? Like, because my main thing is I really didn't like one of my factions was Shadow. And it's the one that let me steal stuff. Well, the stealing Aether didn't really fit with the whole killing things and doing damage. It just seemed counterintuitive. Why would I put out these creatures? They're going to steal stuff just so that I can kill them all with my own cards to give the Aether back. It just didn't make sense. So if I was playing Magic, I would pull those cards out and put new ones in. Well, I can't do that in Keyforge. I'm stuck with that faction because I bought that deck. And that's what makes me want to go buy more cards because now I want to try to get a deck that doesn't have those. And plus, there's, I think, eight factions. Might be seven. I think there's eight. I, I think I would want to try all the factions. 
And then what I would probably do is then go somewhere that has open decks for sale, like CG Realms has a bunch of open decks, and then find the three factions I like the most and buy a deck for that. Or I could do the whole collector's thing and just buy a bunch of decks hoping to get that. But I definitely, like, the, a few weeks back, the question came up on Twitter. I was asking, why are people buying more than one deck? Because the whole point is you buy one deck and learn it, and you're good. Well, I get it, because I like my deck. I really like the, the Bromber, Bomber, Bromber, I think, was the one faction. I really like them. They were really cool. Big, giant dudes doing lots of damage. Gave me flashbacks, because I used to like playing red when I played Magic. Um, so now I kind of want to go around and find a Bromber deck, but without those shadow cards, because I didn't really like the shadow cards. Right. So this this is really the you know the money making aspect of the game the 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 magic thing while not a while not technically a CCG I know yeah. uh, Commander Rift was or someone out there was talking about the four horsemen uh, resale value yeah. but um, yeah I've heard about that what uh, what what people will want to do is find that deck that they are comfortable with and they will keep spending money until they have it um, and then eventually they'll want more because they just want more. But, uh, you know, huh, even yes. though you, even though you can't change it, you know, if you like the game, you're going to want to explore more of the game and you can't yeah. do that without buying more decks. So very true, though. Bruh. I can see in this trading decks being way more popular than, say, when you like people seem to not like trading magic cards. Right. Like when we played, we used to trade magic all the time. But oh, nowadays, yeah. I don't know, people seem to be against it more like we playing for anti. We used to play for anti. Yeah. People are like, oh, my God, there's a chance you could lose that expensive card. Well, we didn't worry about that back then. Yeah. I could totally see being like, dude, if you like Bromber here, I'll trade you this deck. Right. Brobnar there. It's Brobnar. Sorry, Brobnar. I was saying okay. here. So uh, going back to Shadzar's question. So one of the things I didn't talk about at all during this is there seems to be a built-in balance mechanism. So there's a system in the game called Chains. And think of Chains as in tying you down. So in the game, your really powerful cards are going to give you Chains. And what those do is you now draw less cards at the end of your turn. Now there's an online component of the game where you can scan your deck into an app. Right now that does nothing. But what I noticed and what you can see is coming that you scan the deck you're playing, you scan the deck you're playing against, and you log who won. And then what it's going to do is in the future, if those two decks keep playing each other and one keeps beating the other, it's going to give a handicap to the winning deck in the form of chains. And you can tell that that's set up for tournaments. So you're going to show up to a tournament and you're going to scan your deck and it may go, hey, in your next match, you start with three chains because you do have that one deck that can beat every deck. Well, by adding the chain system in, that seems to be set up to offset it. Now, at this point, the chain system isn't fully implemented. It's just you can see the roots of it. So there are cards that use chains now. And now this is something that frustrates me that I don't have a starter set because you have to track your chains. And if you get three chains, it means I, I think it goes up to six. But if you have three chains, it means for three turns in a row, you draw one less card. So you have to track that. Three turns left, two turns left, one turn left, zero turns left. I now no longer have chains. So the way they're going to balance those really powerful decks is you're going to start chain down. So I did see a request to show a card on screen. I can't do that with this because this hasn't been opened yet. If I can reach way back here. All right, here's one of our two decks. I think this was mine. Yeah, this is mine. So here is my deck. I got Erasmother, Basilica Moneylender, was my hero or whatever, your, my Archon. Trying to get some good light there. I think you can see that now. Yeah, can we see the back of it too? So th this is actually the character card. So this shows you the list of cards for this deck. And there's that QR code that you would scan. And then these are the actual cards. They, again, they, they basically look like collectible card game cards. Right. Uh, come on, focus camera. <laughs> all right it doesn't want to focus i'm we hiding get, behind yeah. it there we go we there we go there we go I think. for a second yeah so this is a shadow card that's what's showing up the top i get two amber when i play it and that's what it does when i play it and that's the back of it is unique this is one of the procedurally generated so i guess what that character look besides the name the actual graphic for the characters are also all 100 percent unique i don't know i'm some glowy yellow thing uh, and I'll show off a creature if I can find one here. Here is a creature from the Dis faction, a Shadow Imp. Come on, there we go. Uh, 
And I'm going to toss this away. All right, so there we go. Bonus for joining in live. You get to actually see stuff like that. Though I'm sure this section will be cut out <laughs> in the, uh, the, the audio version because we're probably going long tonight because I'm talkative and I put way too much information about Keyforge. But I noticed people are talking about it. It's a popular game. Yeah. So despite what the guys at the store told me, I got to say buy a starter set. Uh, don't overpay. They'll produce more. They're still printing more. I know they're hard to get. I've seen them stupid prices. Like Amazon right now wants like $75. Don't pay that much. I think they're about $35 MSRP. That's off the top of my head. I could be wrong. Um, it does give you two new decks. Decks are 15 bucks each. So you're already at 30 just for those two decks. Um, then you're going to get two starter decks, which those are actually useless because you just play this like intro game that's not the full game. Then you can never use them again. So that is a waste. But then you're going to get the deck of the two decks of cards that you may need. You're going to get the six key counters. You're going to get a bunch of damage counters. You're going to get a bunch of Aether tokens. You're going to get all the stuff to me that you need to play the game. Now, yes, you could go buy your own. You could supplement your own. You could use your old magic health beads. You can go on Etsy and buy someone's really fancy key versions. But I personally think just grab a starter set. It's going to come with two new decks anyway. It's not that much more than just buying two decks. And then you get all the stuff. Well, you know, there's there's something to be said about using the pieces the game was designed to work with, right? That's these are, it's it's made that way. Yeah. We record the show live Wednesday nights at nine thirty Eastern on Twitch, and we encourage people to drop in and take part in our chat room in the lobby. Thanks to our moderator Angie Games, we've had a lot of chat going tonight with uh, Commander Rip, who seems to be a real uh, fan of Keyforge. Uh, and uh, Shad's are uh, learning, uh, <laughs> learning a bit about that as we go along. Uh, Jeff, uh, yeah, I saw the week we had Jeff Zeus was in earlier. He had Jeff, to take off, but thanks yeah, for Jeff joining us. Uh, Steve D, I know checked in. He's probably cooking. Absolutely. Uh, we've got quite the uh, quite the list of people in there. Although I know a number of them are bots. Not all of them are. And uh, we've, got, <laughs> we've got five viewers right now. So thank you for joining us in watching on uh, Boxing Day. Yeah, and also for those of you not logged into Twitch, we appreciate you watching as well. I know there's a couple of you out there because I always get notes after the show about how you enjoyed the show. And I'm like, oh, you were there. And they're like, I didn't see in the chat. And like, oh, I didn't log in. Or I guess if you watch on third party sites, like you can watch it a couple places. Anyway, welcome. Uh, please post your questions. And she games will make a note of it and we'll get back to them later. Also, just a note ahead of time when the show ends. We will be doing an after the show chat with those of you still here. So don't log out as soon as we say the bell's done and we're locking the doors. That doesn't mean head out. You get the bonus by being here live. We're going to hang around for about half an hour after the show and hang out with you guys. So just I've noticed that our numbers often drop when we say the show's going to end. So note that if you're here live, hang around. We, we do give a little bonus content for those of you here live. Absolutely. And, uh, Thanks for mentioning when my, my cam does freeze up. I know it is happening off and on. I'm, I'm trying to keep track of it, but uh, if you catch it before I do, all the better. Thank you. Yeah, and actually that's a shout out to Tech, who's also in the chat room. Thank Absolutely. you for joining us. So yeah, one note the Shads are, you do not need an app to play except for the fact you may need something to read the rules. Um, for scanning the decks, it's not something you have to do, but when you show up to a tournament, they're going to scan your deck supposedly that's in theory so i don't think you need to bring a phone you just need to bring your deck the one thing that i guess say this game seems fantastic for is sealed deck like show up to a tournament pay 10 15 bucks they hand you a deck and say go like there's no deck building it's literally sit down shuffle your deck and play i'm sure you'll want to look through your deck first and they'll probably give you time to look through to know what to expect but there is no app required the other thing too is i was hoping the app would have the rules the app doesn't even have the rules in it <laughs> which I thought was weird. Like the, the app only seems to exist for this tournament play thing. It lets me scan in my decks and tells me all the cards in them. I don't know. Maybe it's also if I get my stuff shuffled together, I can put it back together quickly. I don't know. Well, I, I, can, suspect, I, like, oh. I suspect they'll probably also do the Pokemon thing. I know Pokemon, you can scan all your uh, starters and boosters and everything. And yeah, it will allow you to play. At. It will allow you to play online against people. So you're not yeah. stuck uh, just playing with the local folk. Uh, to be honest, I hope that's what they do, because like Ascension, there's an awful lot of bits for this game. So being able to play, play, pass and play while at the hotel instead of having to use components from Azul and patchwork would have been pretty cool. 
Well, thanks to everyone who subscribes and listens to the podcast and has made that happen. And for others who take a minute to subscribe to our content on your favorite platform, leave a like, thumbs up, or review so that it's easier for others to find us as well. Uh, sign up to receive Tabletop Bellhop Weekly in your inbox. Uh, once a week, we'll be sending out an email recapping all the content we've released the week previous. Blog posts, new podcast episodes, reviews, anything else we create. I will admit, this week it is going out tomorrow. I had way too much to catch up on today with the holidays, so I did not get it out today, but it should be going out tomorrow. You can sign up at newsletter at .tabletopbellhop.com or go over to the tabletopbellhop.com webpage. You'll find us a lot to subscribe in the sidebar. Now I am throwing a New Year's party and you are all invited. Every year I host a gaming in the New Year's party with some of my closest friends. Now my house isn't big enough for all of you, but I do welcome you to join us as we stream the entire thing live. Here at the regular place, that's twitch.tv slash tabletop bellhop. Now I expect we'll start the live cast sometime around 5 p.m. Eastern Standard. And we'll probably leave it running the full night. So if you do stop in though, be sure to say something in chat so we know you're there. We'll try and keep an eye on chat as we play so that we can interact with anyone dropping by and taking part. Now, normally, each episode, we answer one more of your game, gaming, or game night questions. You can send your questions to us at questions at tabletopbellhop.com, or you can head over to the webpage, tabletopbellhop.com, and click on Ask the Bellhop. I will interrupt for a second to we'll say this out loud so we'll remember. Shadzar is hoping the entire New Year's show is set to explicit, and we'll have to remember to do that because Anchi Games will be playing with us. <sighs> uh, as for sending in your questions, social media works too. Uh, we're everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop One Word. While I prefer if questions come through the website, just they're easier to track that way, I'm not going to say no if you ask me a question elsewhere. All right. Because this is our last episode of 2018, the fact that we are recording on Boxing Day and that this episode will release on New Year's Day, we thought we would take this opportunity to do a year in review style look back at 2018. That's right. Don't worry. We'll get back to you answering your game and game night questions next year. But for now, join us as we look back at 2018 and then ahead to what waits us awaits us for 2019. So... Obviously, the big thing that happened in 2018 is this exists, right? We launched the Tabletop Bellhop, um, something we talked about for years. We had a meeting with Sean at Breakout Con in Toronto. Well, technically not at Breakout Con, at an Irish pub across the street. Well, we did, uh, go, back, we did go back to the con. We, had, we did we go actually, back. We weren't really we were, talking about the podcast then. No, no, we, it was not, we were on a couch outside the... Uh... Yeah, no, we were, at, we were technically at the hotel when we, when we discussed it. Okay, there we go. But yeah, it was definitely a breakout <laughs> con that was in March 2018. Um, talked about Sean trying to convince me to do a podcast as he has for years. Me talking about how I wanted to um, be more involved in the gaming community and put my gaming experience to use. Uh, try to make my hobby my living in a positive way. So Anshi Games and I met with Sean. Um, after that, it did take some time. We met with um, our webmaster, Aaron, who's a good friend of uh, and she games and helps run her blog, mapleleafmommy.com, and worked with us to launch the Tabletop Bellhop blog. That went live on June 29th. Now, my first Tabletop Gaming Weekly article, that's the weekly week in review, uh, came out on July 9th. And then the first Ask the Bellhop, where we answered one of your questions, went live on July 20th. And that was the Catan article, where we talked about all the various different forms of Catan. Well... It's been a long time coming, but at least from the feedback we seem to be getting, people agree that we've made the right choice and we're moving in the right direction. And uh, we'd like to hear if you agree or if you don't. Uh, your your <laughs> yeah. views your views help us uh, create this content for you. Yeah, please, feedback. Like, we share the feedback we get, and I wish we got more. Especially negative. Like, not that I want to hear bad things, but if you think there's something we can do better, please let us know. So then we get to what we're doing right now. We recorded our first ever podcast right here on Twitch on Thursday, July the 26th. Nope, back then we did record on Thursdays, not on Wednesdays. Being silly and not realizing that we were trying to compete with Critical Role, which is just silly. Um, that podcast and the associated YouTube video went live on July 31st. And here we are now on December 26th recording our 22nd episode. 
Though actually, I think it's about our 25th or 26th recording because we had a couple bonus episodes. Yep. So since that time, 23 episodes have gone live as well as several video-only specials. Uh, more than 2,000 <laughs> listens, almost 200 nice. podcast subscribers, and we're closing in on that 100 YouTube subscribers. Not to mention our status here on Twitch, growing bit by bit every week. We may not be able to compete with those uh, three days a week, three hours a day gamers, but uh, no. we're making our, our presence known. Now, I do want to thank all of you for joining us. Uh, those of you listening, those of you who read the blog, those of you in our chat right now. Uh, this thing, this whole thing, the whole podcasting thing is pretty new to us. Uh, the live streaming especially. Uh, we're still learning. Now, I think we've made some great improvements over the last six months, and I expect at this point that things will only get better. <clears throat> so I had a very audio focus in mind when uh, when we started this. My, my concept was a podcast. With uh, Now, Mo uh, and Enchi Games pushed us towards video and the Twitch world because that's what people are watching. That's what people are selling. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm old. I wasn't doing that yet, but I am now. And... Uh, <laughs> And I've been learning so much. So I hope our subscribers can enjoy the improvements we're making along the way, both artistic and technical, uh, and uh, continue to evolve with us. So let's get back to talking games. So earlier today, I loaded up BoardGameGeek.com and took at a look at my plays this year. I did the whole, pulled down the entire list of every game I played this year, every game I logged. Um, it's worth noting that I am pretty religious about logging my plays on Board Game Geek, but I do miss a few here and there. So I thought it'd be interesting to know what I actually got played and what got played the most specifically. Well, statistics can really reveal a lot about your preferences and habits. Now, because we discuss ours on a regular basis, they're pretty well known. But uh, if you are interested in, in getting a better feel for what you like over an entire year, uh, statistics like uh, what you've played on Board Game Geek can uh, help inform you. Very much true. So doing some quick math this afternoon, it looks like I played 116 different games. Now these are games, not expansions. And of those 116 games, I played them 295 times. So you're like talking about, so to, to break it all out, it could be, it would be like playing a different game every three days, uh, twice. <laughs> Uh, now we know that. Now we know that isn't the truth. This is statistics, and statistics all lie. Yes. But uh, yeah, <laughs> that's that's what you're looking at, basically. If they were evenly spaced out, um, I binge game. I think most people binge game. It's it's definitely not one one game every three days. It's more like we get together on Saturday and play six games. And looking at the number of plays, I definitely didn't play twice each. There is a surprising number of games I only played once this last year. I don't. I could open up the list. I'm not going to bother. We're going slow enough tonight. Me dragging up the statistics. I had it available if we wanted to. But uh, yeah, it's it's a lot of games. So what I'm going to look at first is most play games, like literally just by the numbers. Uh, number one for me in 2018 is Pandemic Legacy Season 1. Uh, this is the one we played with Tori and Kat, the other couple who comes on Friday nights. Um, when I'm talking about Gloomhaven Night, well, at one time that was our Pandemic Legacy Night. Now, I was never a big fan of Pandemic. Oh, that's not true. When it first came out, I loved it. It was something new and it blew my mind, but I got tired of it pretty quickly. I would say I normally would say I'm not a fan of Pandemic, but I did dig Legacy. Uh, it's quite the experience, and it's one I actually do recommend to most groups. And it's the story and the legacy aspects of the game that draw me to it. Now, the mechanics of Pandemic are the mechanics of Pandemics, but some of the twists that were in that game were predictable. Like, yeah, okay, I knew that was going to happen. I would have been surprised if they didn't. But there were a couple that took us all by surprise. Now, I mean, Gloomhaven took over for Pandemic quite yeah. late in the year, so it's not really a surprise, uh, not to mention the time it takes to play Gloomhaven with its setup and everything. I, it's yeah. just hard to get as many plays in with it unless you've got a Gloomhaven room. <laughs> <laughs> True. Yeah, that's a, when we played Pandemic, we tended to play two to three missions a night, so we definitely went through that a little quicker. Right. Though I have a feeling if, assuming all the cards fall properly, 
Gloomhaven may be this game next year. It may be the top of my list because it's the one game we want to play once a week. Right? Like, I'm, it'd be really cool that next week I can say I played Gloomhaven 52 times. The odds of that happening are extremely slim, but I'd be happy with half that, right? Yeah. Uh, probably even a quarter of that. <laughs> so up next comes Seven Wonders, and I, that, I blame Board Game Arena because uh, I got to say I'm not a huge fan of Seven Wonders. It's an okay game. It's great for big groups. There are not a lot of games in my collection that play seven players. I own a copy of it. And I have it mainly for public play. So when I show up to game night and there's seven people there and no one can agree on what to play, I'm like, all right, we could all play Seven Wonders. Um, I also use it for big events. Like we, the gaming in the New Year party, I wouldn't be surprised if we play Seven Wonders when it's that in-between period when we have six, seven people there, but we don't have quite enough to split into two groups. It's an okay game. Um, it is really well done, though, on Board Game Arena. And I actually prefer playing it on Board Game Arena because it does all the math. And I got to admit... Uh, there's not a lot of long-term strategy. So it's not like when you're playing some of the other games on Board Game Arena and you haven't played in a little while and you log in, you're like, what the heck was I doing? It's pretty easy in Seven Wonders to look at what you have and figure out where you were going and just take your move, jump in, click on a card, move on. So yeah. by Board Game Arena making it so simple, I play it on there a lot. Yeah, no, it's a great game for Board Game Arena because there's not that huge reliance on memory. So yeah. that that spatial and the, the time... Uh, problem doesn't really matter. Uh, most of what you need is right there in front of you. You can see your cards. You can see everyone else's cards. The only thing you have to do is remember what has been passed. But even that, yeah. if you want to keep notes, but... you can. They do have notes on BGA, which we don't usually use, but they're there. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, no, overall, it's just a, a well, uh, well-designed thing. And you can even actually change. That's the one game where you can usually change your, if you click on the wrong card, you can change that until yes. someone else plays next. Uh, and and having that undo function is is missing in most of the board game arena games. Yes. So that's a nice touch. Yeah, that, that is a big complaint against board game arena for me, and always has been. Okay. Uh, to be honest, board game arena. I'm gonna pause for a second, jump out. I told you I'm rambling tonight. I don't know. I'm off on a tangent. Uh, big shout out to board game arena. There's a 2018 landmark for us. 2018 is the year I started playing games on board game arena and started gaming online with Sean with Eric with Eric's wife um, and his friend Steve, I think is her name. And I, it's, I'll admit right now with the holidays, everything going on, I'm doing a bad job. I, I log in and I make my one move and I leave it for 48 hours. But it was nice to be able to do that. There were some slow nights where we sat and played. There were nights Sean and I sat and played game after game with the Kaido Live. We even streamed one live to try yep. that out. And she Games and I were playing a lot of two-player Race for the Galaxy uh, props to Board Game Arena. I'm glad I found that this year. I got to thank Aaron Franklin for introducing me to it, and huge props to his wife for actually gifting me with the subscriber account, subscriber subscriber account, so that we can play some of those games that aren't free to play. Uh, props. I like I like Board Game Arena. It's it's a very nice, useful tool. At some point in the new year, we're going to try to do that comparison between the three different online gaming things. It won't be early in the new year. I don't know when we'll get to it, but that's on the list. I do want to check out the other sites. So jumping it back into physical games I played, or not, this counts both actually, I shouldn't say that, but I did play this a lot physically because I don't think it's on Board Game Arena. If it did, it'd break the server because so many people would be playing it, and that is Azul. Uh, this would be number one. This would be my most played game of 2018 if it wasn't for Board Game Arena, if it wasn't for being able to jump into Seven Wonders or over and over again or Takedo multiple times. Uh, this is no surprise. We talk about how often I play it. Uh, it's a great game. It's easy to teach, difficult to master, small footprint, does all the good things. It looks fantastic. It catches people's eyes. Like, there, there's very little things. Like, in general, if someone says, recommend me a game, I could probably say Azul and not be wrong. No matter who they are, what kind of games they like and what they're into, they're probably going to dig it. Even if they're hardcore miniature gamers, they'll probably find something to like in it. Uh, one of the perfect examples is one of the biggest OSR D&D players is an almost idiot savant amazingly good at Azul. And he doesn't play board games and normally would say, I hate board games. And he rocked Azul and wanted to go buy a copy. You know, so many people have been introduced to this game. It's it's really been uh, a trending topic everywhere. And while yeah. we don't generally follow the hottest things, this game no. is just deserving of that title. Uh, and I have seen it on many top lists this year. Yeah, it's... It, it's well deserved it's not often a game lives up to the hype you know i've been saying gloomhaven doesn't belong in number one on board game Geeks. azul does like yeah. i don't know how 
it's not there. It, it is one of those games that, like, when we were talking about Concordia and how no game is the perfect game, that's as close as I've seen. Yep. So up next is Race for the Galaxy. We talk about this game a lot because it's one of my favorite games. Now, the only reason it's this high last year is, again, Board Game Arena. But even without Board Game Arena, I still would have had a, not a small number of plays of Race for the Galaxy. Like, we played at Queen City Conquest. Um, and she games and I bring it out to coffee shops. It's one of my favorite games. I don't expect that to change. It's already over 10 years old, and I still enjoy it. Well, I do, do dig playing this one online. For whatever reason, I prefer it in person. I don't know what it, why I prefer the components. It's not like one of those games where you're putting out workers, but I dig it. I like it. I like it physically better than playing digitally for some reason, the feel of the cards. What I'm looking forward to is Sean has said he's going to figure out figure it out this year. So I am looking forward to teaching him how to play Race for the Galaxy on New Year's. Maybe he'll come down before everyone else shows up or we'll live stream it. Sean Lurds Race for the Galaxy. <laughs> I may or may not end up liking it, but I'll be damned if I'm not going to learn this game. <laughs> yeah, we are going to get it out there. The game with the stupidest learning curve because of all the icons. So up next is Takedo. Again, I blame this 100% on Board Game Arena. Like, I dig the physical version of Takedo, but I played my physical version once in 2018. Um, but somehow I ended up playing three consecutive games online. And when one finishes, I get invited to a rematch and I keep sitting except. So as of right now, I could open board game arena and I would have three games of Takedo going. I think if we gave it three days, it would jump to the top of the list above pandemic legacy. It would just fly up there because we're, it's like every other day we finish a game at Takedo. Yep. Uh, this, this, this one is actually, it's interesting because Takedo has finally become Zen for me. Um, <laughs> I've finally become comfortable enough with all the options and all the different potential that I'm feeling incredibly confident which with my choices each turn. Um, and, you know, I, I've won the last two games. And while I don't expect to win, I feel like I'm getting closer to being able to maximize what is what I can do given the available choices on what everyone else has done. Um, yeah. So as someone else can make, a, can make a, a different choice and, and force me somewhere. But I feel like... For me, with what I'm able to do, I'm going to choose a, a more a more maximal choice. Uh, and that allows right. it to become quite zen. Uh, yeah, there you go. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a little more zen when you're not like, oh, you stole the only spot when you realize, oh, it's not the only spot. I could do this yeah. instead. I think the biggest advantage there is crossroads. I think without crossroads, yeah, you never hit that zen. Because with crossroads, you get that second option, right? Ab absolutely. Where you're like, yep. I, I'll admit that's there's there's the actual highlight of 2018 was trying Crossroads for Takedo for the first time. That that's the winner there. Takedo was a good game. Adding Crossroads is a is a huge benefit. Yeah. So now we get to one of the good ones. Not that the other games <laughs> aren't good, but I've mentioned I'm not a huge fan of Seven Wonders of Takedo. This is one I love, and that's Terraforming Mars. Like to me, this should have been up there under Zool. I'm still loving Terraforming Mars. Um, I got the Prelude expansion for Christmas. Uh, that's definitely coming out New Year's, if not before. I am really itching to play that. You know, I have to say I love this one my first try, and I'm looking forward to, to trying Venus, and I didn't even know about Prelude, so uh, I'll, I guess yeah. I'll be picking that one up too, or, or trying that uh, one what as well. What Prelude does is jump starts the game, so you end up starting with uh, a focus at the beginning. So you get, what is their, their contracts from, from like whatever, the Earth Corporation, so that you're, you start off partway into the game with some type of focus and, and production. And they say basically it can cut up to an hour off the game, which is kind of which I think is going to be good with Venus because right. Venus started to make me think it was getting to be a little too long in the teeth. So I think combining the two may make Venus better. And what I think we might have to do at some point is pull out all the Venus cards and try Prelude without Venus, though I'm not looking forward to sorting all those cards. Right. So now I don't want to talk about every game on my list. So I'm just going to go the next few in order of play, just so you know them. So up next after Terraforming Mars was Fallout, the board game, then Gloomhaven, Terra Mystica. One that surprised me is Flick Fleet, which was a Kickstarter from Jackson Pope, who sent me a prototype copy of his game and is actually up there in my top 10 games played this year. So if Jackson Pope, if you're listening, I dug your game enough that it beat out a ton of other games, including three of my favorites, which are coming up next, which are Anachrony, Bruges, and The Climbers. All of these are fantastic games. None of these, well, Terra Mystica is probably up there a bit from Bird Game Arena, but I think since we started, I've only finished three games because it takes that damn long. And I do still like my physical copy, but the rest of those, nothing to do with Board Game Arena, just games I played a lot this year. Now, I saw one here. I, I, I noticed it, the, an absence of one on this list, 
Uh, but yep. uh, I know uh, I'm pretty sure we're getting to that after. So let's uh, okay. let's see what's coming up. <laughs> so this is the the funky part, right? So just because I played a game a lot doesn't mean it's a game I love or it's my favorite game, right? You would think there's there's correlation there, but not always because. I play a lot in public and people ask me to play games and I bring out games at public events that I may not choose to play myself. Plus the whole playing on board game arena because the game's easy and simple tends to mess up that ratio, right? That's why seven wonders is way up there. I don't love seven wonders, but I play it because it's quick and easy on board game arena. It's a nice distraction and I enjoy the bit of chat we have. Eric Franklin likes to have Twitter chats after every game to talk about what he did right and wrong. So I thought it'd be worth looking at just off the top of my head, the five best new games I played in 2018. So this isn't based on the number of plays. This is just based on looking through the list going, oh man, that was a good game. Now, it's interesting. I, I was actually thinking as we as I was reading through this earlier, it, it might almost be worth having two separate uh, BGG accounts. One for your play, you know, the games that you are playing as, as you, uh, and then a separate account for... Um, the 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 bellhop and the WGR games um, because they're, they're they're very they're very different in many cases. Um, yeah, you know. the thing is, like the the WGR games or whatever, I am still playing it. It's still a game I played. Well, absolutely, if, and it, I, it'd be different. It's... Like, do I only want to log the games I liked, or do I want to log the games I played? Now, I do have an account for the Windsor Gaming Resource. Uh, that was back when I was actually in charge of organizing a lot more of the local events. So I actually used to post monthly what the most popular games were. But what I would do there is log every game played at the event, right? So I would go around and ask people, what'd you play tonight? What'd you play tonight? And track all that. Right. So that was a different way to do it. But I still log my own plays as my plays because I played them. Right. But I, what I'm seriously considering is either not logging my plays for Board Game Arena next year or just knowing which ones are Board Game Arena plays and discounting them when I make these lists because I find that is kind of muddying the waters. Absolutely. There's there's definitely a uh, a real um, sort of shift when you when you look at that yeah. GA uh, data. So these five games, these are new to me. I don't think any of them actually are new as of 2018. I don't think any of them came out in 2018. Um, as often happens on this, uh, we don't necessarily play the the new hotness. Hotness. I play games. Excuse me. Give me a second here. I play games that interest me, and those may be really old games, or they may be really new games. Yeah, in case you're new, we do not lean on the hotness here. Uh, these are real games picked by the bellhop because he wants to play them, not because they're on a new release list or some publisher has sent them in. Uh, not that we're saying we wouldn't play something new from the publisher, but uh, <laughs> but you know we're we're here to play what we want to play, and uh, you know we aren't on that quick release uh, from the publishers. Uh, list right now yeah so just just as a heads up in the um idea of uh transparency i'm not the dice tower i do not get games from publishers i have gotten review copies of games they're usually pre-releases and kickstarters i've yet to receive a brand new shiny game from a publisher to review and if that ever does happen we will let you know uh that is why i mentioned that i was sent a copy of flick fleet fried jackson poke so we do plan to be transparent about that. Um, the games I buy, I do research. It's not like I just buy random games like, oh, there's an old game. I want to play it. I do do research. It is based on somewhat the hotness. Like I'm not going to buy a game that has no buzz. But usually I hear about a game on a podcast or something. And when I do find a game, I will do the research before buying. I'm like, oh, I've never seen this before. Then it's grab my phone, go to Board Game Geek, look at the ratings. So it's not just random games I buy. But yeah, it's definitely not a whole um, it's not a whole must get the new hot game. Plus, I just don't have the budget to buy games that I did last year. So that also has an effect on what games I'm playing, especially when I have a significant pile of shame. Yeah. So going into those five games. So number one is Anachrony. Uh, this is a time travel resource management engine building game set in a post-apocalyptic future. This is a huge table hog with lots and lots of little components and bits and crystals, and it's intimidating. 
But what you can't tell until you sit down and play is that the decision tree grows, grows very slowly. You start off with, I think it's only about six options. And then as you increase your number of workers and build more buildings, it expands outward and the decisions grow and your options grow as you play the game. So as you get more comfortable with the game, you get more options. It's brilliantly done. I love the time travel thing in this game. You can send yourself resources from the future. That is very neat. You have to then pay them back um, before the end of the game or you risk paradox, which is very cool. Um, there's the exosuit minis that came from the expansion where you actually slot your workers in. It, it is fantastic. The problem with this game is that the amount of space and the intimidation factor of this game scares people away. So I'll bring this out to a game night and they'll see people see the big box and they'll look at the back of the box or I'll start setting it up and people are like, oh, no, sorry, I can't. I can't do that. Or, oh, man, let's or even just we only have an hour to well, an hour to play wouldn't be enough time. But if we only have two hours, it's not a quick setup. It takes a while to open all this stuff. So, yeah, that's the one problem with the game is it scares people away and it doesn't hit the table, which it kind of counter to the bellhop's law. I wish it hit the table more often, but I can't convince people to play it. But how can you complain about a game based on an aspect of Bill and Ted's excellent adventure? <laughs> exactly. The whole we put that there when yep, we came yep. last time. Hey, hey I remember we've got to put time. the key. We've got to put the keys behind the uh, thing so that we can so that we find them there later. Yep. Yep. <sighs> uh, up next, Fallout. Oh man, I still every time I talk about this game, why why do I love it? I don't get it. It has a terrible scoring system. About quarter of the time, one or more players gets a bad draw. And at the start, it starts out the bad start at the beginning of the game and is basically out of it. There's the frustration of having someone else finish the mission you've been working on all along. Um, even right now, while complaining about the problems with the game, I'm thinking, man, we could probably play this on New Year's. And like, I, I know there's people who have tried to fix stuff online and I don't even care. I just want to play the game as it is. I love this game. I don't know what it is. It, it has so many problems, but I like it. Yeah, the theme, the potential, and and the parts. Uh, you know, it's a it's a pre game. There is a lot yeah. to like about it. It just happens to have some drawbacks. Serious drawbacks, though. Like, I, I, there's other games that have less problems with them. I'm like, oh, I'll never play that game again. It's broken. Something keeps drawing me back to to Fallout, and I still haven't tried the expansion. I was kind of hoping it'd be under the tree. It wasn't under the tree. That might be something I pick up with Christmas money. I don't know. There's a birthday coming up, so maybe I'm not allowed to shop. I'm not sure. <laughs> if I can get that before New Year's, we're totally playing Fallout with the, the expansion. Uh, next, best of 2018. Best games I played. 2018, new games. Bruges. A quick Steffenfeld. Yes, quick Steffenfeld together. Shouldn't happen. I love Steffenfeld. Some of my favorite games of all time are Felds. Um, In the Year of the Dragon, Castles of Burgundy, Macau, Notre Dame. He is the master of the point salad. The, you have lots of different options. You have lots of things you can do, and all of them give you points. And what do you focus on? What do you not focus on? Do you try to do all the things? If you try to do all the things, you're going to fail. Oh, I love Steffenfeld games. Bruges gives you all of that field. Feel. Field and Feld. Bruges gives you all of that feel of the big Feld game in under an hour. Uh, it's a fantastic use of multi-use cards. There are tons of ways to score points. There's a huge decision tree. This is the opposite of anachrony. See, people should be more scared of Bruges than anachrony. Because when you start off Bruges, it's like, oh my God, what do I do? I have so many options. It is a brain burner in a small package, and I love it. You know, not much more to say about this, but I must point out that NG Games has said, no, you are not allowed to shop. <laughs> oh, see? There you go. See, I, I had a feeling. That often happens in this period. Yeah. My birthday's in January, so I get hit with this this uh, shipping purchasing embargo for a couple weeks here. There we go. Which is probably I, a good sign. You probably need some getting the Fallout expansion. So at my birthday party, we'll play Fallout with the expansion. All right. And next up, we so, have... Uh, St. Petersburg, the second edition. Now, I love the original St. Petersburg. This is one of the older Aaliyah big box games. Like, 
it's classic, like Catan. It's that time period. There was no way I was going to buy this shiny new version from Z-Man Games. Like, I was perfectly happy with the original game, one of the best games in my collection. We still played it at least once a year, and then we usually binge it. It's like, oh, I want to play St. Petersburg, and I'll bring it out to a bunch of events in a row. Then it goes on the shelf, and three months later, we bring it out again. But then I found a deal I couldn't pass up at a local game store, like literally 15 bucks for a sleeved used copy. I, I couldn't help it. I had to buy that. We played. I sold my original instantly. Well, sorry, I put it in the Extra Life auction like that day. I'm like, done. Don't need the old game anymore. Uh, this adds a market phase, which is cool because it doesn't really change the focus of the game, but does give a new potential path to victory or a way to diversify to get more money and points while going through. It is a fantastic addition of the game. The fact that you can now play five players instead of four and it still works to me is great, but just a bonus because I would have liked it even without that. And then there's all the mini expansions. I haven't even tried them all yet, and I'm already in love with this game. You know, it's so fantastic when a a new edition of a game can keep the, the power and the wonder of that game and just up the ante. You know, it just brings it to that next level without ruining what was already a fantastic game. I totally agree. So I also had to put an RPG on this list, something I didn't do um, when I wrote the blog post when looking back at 2018. So as usual, even though we do produce similar content on multiple platforms, it's not all the same stuff. So it is worth checking out all of our types of content. Um, so I tossed a wrestling game on here, or, or an RPG on here, which is also a wrestling game. Uh, that's Worldwide Wrestling from uh, Nathan de Pioletta. Uh, this is a Powered by the Apocalypse game that attempts to recreate the world of professional wrestling. Now, not just the wrestling, not just the characters, not just the ring, but all the drama that happens both on and off camera. This is a fantastic game. Now, I'll I did have the advantage that I got to play it with the designer uh, of the game running it at Breakout Con. Uh, that hooked me completely. I managed to find a copy of the game at Origins. It was a little hard to find for a while now. Now it's easy to find. Uh, this game does an amazing job of immersing you into the world support of sports entertainment. Um, the other thing that's cool is trying it out with my local group. It, you don't have to be a fan of wrestling. As long as you have a passing familiarity with it, which anyone who grew up in the 80s has because you couldn't avoid it, you're going to get it. You're going to understand what's happening. It is such a great game. This game just has so much potential. Uh, I still haven't actually sat down with it, but I know back in the day uh, of the uh, University of Windsor, we would have been playing this regularly. No question in my mind. Oh, yeah. Definitely. So last game I'm going to mention, this is actually, I think I end up with six games because I tossed in the wrestling, but last best new game I found in 2018. I'm sure you know what this is going to be. This is Azul. I've said enough about this game on the show. Uh, did we mention Azul? I, I hardly remember. <laughs> I, I think we've talked about it once or twice. So there is one more game I want to talk about. Um, this is my biggest surprise of 2018. The game I, I would not have expected to like at all. Uh, that's Laser Riders. Now, when the company that land, launched it, I sorry, I forget the name, Greater Than Games, maybe. Sorry, I have that wrong. I should have looked that up. Um, but whenever they launched their Kickstarter, I thought it was neat. I'm like, oh, this is cool. They took the flight pass system for X-Wing, but they're leaving the templates on the board, so it's kind of like light cycles. That's cool. But it wasn't cool enough to back the kickstarter to me it, it looked neat but yeah sure um but thankfully enough other people did think it was neat enough and they did back the kickstarter and the game did get made so that's greater than games yeah now we keep mentioning this and it's just great this is the one that i i had i expected to see up higher in the list uh, yeah. it's a great it's not just great looking it's got great play great design and draws in the eye of public if you're if you are playing it at the FLGS or at a con, uh, it's it's the packaging. Everything about this game is just surprisingly good. Mm -hmm. No, I agree. Um, the reason I wanted to call it out special because of that, how surprising it is. Because like when that Kickstarter ended, I forgot about it. I whatever it was a game it was a Kickstarter. I didn't back. Uh, then there was a crazy good deal. I think it was Prime Day or something, and I ordered the game, and it showed up, and I'm like, eh, oh, I am a little disappointed because the case isn't actually VHS-sized. I hoped it was VHS-sized. And I opened it, and I'm like, oh, man, look at these vacuum foam trays. Oh, God, everything has holograms on it. Oh, what a gimmick. This, 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 this is something else. 
And I was hoping that it would be some silly fun. But as Sean mentioned, it is so much more than that. Like, this game requires actual strategy and planning. Um, it requires skill at judging angles and trying to predict distances. Uh, there is even a social... Um, Social deduction, like reading the other players, is part of the game. Is he going to turn towards you or is he going to go away? You're joshing me, Jair. Wait, are you coming towards me? You're going to steal my crystal? You're going to, like, that's all part of the game. Like, and it actually does reward multiple plays. The more you play the game, you will get better, especially at knowing the links and the distances and your curves. I've found that I am way better at the game than my first play where I drove into someone's laser line without even trying. Um, it still has. A random element, it still has the push or luck thing, right? If you go too fast, it's hard to turn. You might go straight. Um, so it's not all pure strategy. Like, don't don't be thinking I'm saying this is the new chess, right? No, <laughs> it's it's still a pretty silly thematic game more so than a, a, an abstract strategy, uh, huge tactical game. No, it just has way more of that than I thought. I was expecting a silly gimmick and got a good game. We've also found it's just as good three and four players, and it does feel like Tron Light Cycles. It pulls it off. If you had told me that a, a relatively silly cardboard game will have well replicated the Tron Light Cycle experience, not to mention sort of bring back that 80s nostalgia in a powerful way, I would have laughed. Yeah. But they've done it. No, it's 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 true. Like I, I'm still kind of shocked. That's that's why I put this in there. Is surprising. Like you said, yeah, it probably should have been higher up on the list. It, I did play it a lot. It didn't make my top ten games I played this year, but it was up there. I think it was number eleven or twelve. But I kind of wanted to do a special shout out to this game because it it's got a special place this year. Like I, yeah. and everyone I show it to, it's the same thing, right? Like I bring it out and people are like, oh wow, yeah, this really is good, no, right? It's... Like no one believes it until they play it, and they're like, oh wow, that's that's really neat. Yeah, it deserves Especially, a special Especially when place. I hooked the hardcore miniature guys at Extra Life, that's when I'm like, oh, I know I got a winner here where I've got the War Machine guys sitting there trying to pre-measure, and I got the X-Wing players out there. And they're like, oh, these templates don't quite match the X-Wing ones. That's throwing me off, right? I'm okay. like, oh, yeah, this is a good game. Excellent. So now I know, Sean, you don't play nearly as many games as I have, but with QCC, a few events at my place, as well as I know you've been gaming with your kids, you probably played more games in 2018 than in a number of years. Any highlights for this year? Well, I mean, I, Azul is definitely a highlight, but again, we talk about it a lot. So uh, interestingly, <laughs> the one I went out and ordered after playing uh, and, and when you shared a deal is the Duke. Um, oh. what's, what's annoying, though, is that I keep forgetting that I ordered it because Amazon still hasn't delivered it after several months. So I need to actually seven track. Months. Well, several, not seven. Um, it, 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 every once in a while, I get a, new, a notification that they're still going to deliver it to me. Um, but I'm not actually quite sure where it was. It's, and I ordered it from .com instead of .ca. So hopefully that one comes up because I think my son is going to love it. Um, and it's, it's one that I, I really want to enjoy with him. And that's, uh, and that was all after our, uh, our launch party, um, that I picked that yep. up. Um, oh, it's a fantastic game. Hopefully they eventually get it to you. That's <laughs> yeah, exactly. Ridiculous. Uh, well, I mean, it's not like they're going to charge me if they don't deliver it. So I'm not, or you know, True. I can get the money back, but uh, the other one was I enjoyed the learning experience of Big Trouble in Little China. Uh, we didn't have a great time with the game. The game was kind <laughs> no. of a disaster in many ways. We went about it all the wrong way. Oh, but yeah. being able to look at it um, and, and realize that we went about it the wrong way and see where we were playing it like gamers and not like mm -hmm. someone who loved the movie Big Trouble in Little China uh, was fantastic. Um, and, and I enjoyed that experience. Uh, and then uh, moving on for my little role playing experience, because we went to QCC, um, you know, I learned about modern RPGs. I had really been out of the whole RPG world for so long, uh, you know, D&D &D and Warhammer and were my games. And, and to move into this new, modern, accepting, inclusive world of RPGs mm -hmm. that has developed uh, was both eye opening and and sort of refreshing. Um and I found out that, you know, at this point, Fate Accelerated is sort of the system I'm, I want to lean towards as it plays the way that I feel most comfortable playing, I think. Very cool. Yeah. Fate Accelerated is dirt cheap on Amazon.ca right now for Boxing Day. I don't know why. Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I need to play more Fate. That game of Iron Edda was, was rather good. Yeah. I could not get Fate reading it the first time, but sitting and playing, now I get it. Well, and, and, and talking with Tracy about it, uh, you know, made things easier too, right? You know, when, you, when you've got someone that close to the game, 
uh, who mm -hmm. can who can who can help you understand it at a deeper level is always going to be a little easier uh, when the book than than a book. Yeah, they were an awesome teacher. I was actually really impressed by the way Tracy presented it. It just clicked. Which Absolutely. makes sense. It's his system, right? And it was his yeah. game, but still, <laughs> he, he made fate click a lot better than anyone else has. And uh, as a little shout out, he just did an interview over on Gnome Stew. On Gnome Stew. Oh, very cool. Yeah, yeah I think this yeah. book's out. I, I didn't have the money. I, I wish I could have afforded to back Ironetta. I'm right. hoping it ends up in stores so eventually I can pick up a copy. Excellent. The next time I see him in real life, I'll try to see if he'll give me a review copy or something. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure they'll uh, they'll hook hook you up. Probably. So enough about looking back. Um, how about the future? So I know one of the big things Sean's been working on a lot near the end of the year this year that's starting to come out is improving the look of our YouTube content. Now, right now, it's it's just some cute graphics and and spending a little more time on it uh, to edit it down a little tighter. Uh, unfortunately, video content takes a lot of time. Yeah. Uh, but what I'm working on is I'm building up workflows and uh, I'm improving my techniques. Uh, I've got some training classes, um, online training that I want to I want to sort of work through as time allows to help that even more. Oh, excellent! Uh, I know I've liked what I've seen. Again, I would love some feedback. So if you guys check out the YouTube channel, if Absolutely. you watch us on YouTube, if you're watching us on YouTube right now, feel free to comment. I would love to know. Um, if it's working for you, if this is good, what you'd like to see. The other thing we were talking about, again, I'm going off script here, is um, adding more video to the Twitch stream in a way. So one of the things, here's something I want to hear from people who produce video content. What do you do for images of the games? So I talked to people at the Dice Tower, and they just grabbed the image off Board Game Geek, and everyone seems cool with that. I went on Daniel Zayas, who we had on the show, has a whole group about board game reviewers and media, and everyone says, I just grabbed the product shot. Technically, that's not legal. Like, I've done the research, and I get it. Most companies probably aren't going to complain because you're, compla you're, you're, you're promoting their product, right? Like, in my head, I don't see why any company would complain. Like, the Plan B games should not be upset if we put up a picture of Azul but for all the good things we have to say about it, right? But I also know there's companies out there that are Disney's who uh, don't like their content anywhere and will aggressively litigate to keep their content safe. And I don't want to lose this Twitch stream or our YouTube channel or get the blog shut down just because we had a picture of the game. Now, Shadzar is saying, take a picture of the product yourself. That's great for the games I own. I don't own all the games we talk about, especially when we're talking about like the kids' games, especially the ones for when the kids were younger. We got rid of those games. So, yes, we could throw up some pictures. I still own Azul. I can throw up a picture of Azul. But what do you do for the rest? I would love to know how we can integrate more of that. And part of me wants to say, let's just do what everyone else is doing because everyone else is doing it. They're getting away with it. Why wouldn't me? But this is my livelihood. This is my source of income. I am the tabletop bellhop. This is my job. This is my full-time job. And I don't want to risk that and lose that just by putting up a picture I shouldn't have on a video. Yeah, and it's one thing on Twitch where uh, content is somewhat uh, somewhat fleeting, um, mm -hmm. although we do do our highlights. But uh, YouTube takes co copyright more seriously. Um, and now with the loss of the um, platform protection in the American laws that has recently come about, uh, they're going to be even tighter about copyright because they are no longer legally protected against what happens, what other people post on their website. So it's, it, it is something that we need to look at. And yeah, maybe, maybe emailing the company for promo media is correct. Maybe, maybe we do need to reach out and make some uh, deals with PR teams. Yeah. But uh, See, I, that'll work. And the problem with that is our tight schedule. Yeah. If we had a two week schedule or if we record the podcast, but release two weeks later, that gives us time to get that content. So that that's one of the issues, right? So we record now on Wednesday and we produce well the YouTube's usually done before that, but it goes out on Tuesday, right? But we usually have it done before the weekend. So it's just a bit of time, right? But yeah, it's it's you can uh, actually there's lots of companies that like to offer you high res photos as if that's payment for some of the work you're doing. I do see that. So I don't know. It's it's one of the things we we're, we're looking for. I I think the problem is we need expert advice, not just advice from other streamers who think they know what's legal and what's not. 
But anyway, another side tangent because I've decided there, there there are no railroad this game. We're we're wandering. We're playing in the sandbox. There we so go. The end of year sandbox. <laughs> so jumping back on topic a bit is one of our goals for 2019. Hopefully, very early in 2019. Speaking of YouTube, has hit 100 subscribers. Uh, this lets us get a vanity URL. I hate sharing our YouTube channel because it's not youtube.com forward slash tabletop bellhop. It's youtube.com forward slash two eight six pound hyphen whatever. It's a bunch of garbage. And we can't say it on the show. And even sharing links, it looks terrible. I am really hoping that the work Sean's doing is going to help us get those subscribers, but we aren't there yet. Uh, and just to be clear, Shadzar, I was talking about uh, Section 230 of the Safe Harbors of the Communication Decency Act, which have been clarified and basically revoked um, for the American legal scholars. <laughs> now, yeah, so uh, I'm happy to spend time on YouTube content if we know people are enjoying it. Uh, if we yeah. are getting likes and subscriptions and, and view time, then it makes sense for me to sp uh, spend the time improving that content. Um, while Twitch is great, there is a certain level of unpolished because it's live. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas YouTube is that place where I can take the content and, you know, if if people want it, I can polish it up and, and give it that shine. Um, and, mm -hmm. uh, the more, and the more we get, the more we are able to offer. We're able to have, have links in that video, in that video content eventually. And we are able to, you know, have useful links at the end of videos, not just the subscribe or here's mm -hmm. another video. Um, and, and we need people for that. We need people and we need views. So the more of that we get, the more of that we can offer. And now does 100 give us links or no? Is it uh, that? that, that I have to dig into. And again, I can't even okay. always, I assume that YouTube keeps it the same. They, they do a yeah, little bit of, that's true too. There is it's a little bit of a moving target. started in June. Yeah. There is, there's a little bit of a moving target going on. They need to, uh, to, to play around. Like what I'd love to do on YouTube is when we're talking about a game, a picture of the game shows up. And if you click on that picture of the game, you can buy the game, right? Like that's, that's the dream. Like that's how yeah. we want it to work. So it, it just, and, but even before that, I just want to hit a hundred so we can share the link better. Yes. You yeah. can use bit.ly. The problem is bit.ly. Some sites block, some ad blockers block bit.ly. Um, if I post a bit.ly link on Google plus I get banned. And yes, I know people are going to tell me Google plus is going away anyway, but we have a surprising number of people who consume our content through Google plus still. I know people didn't really adopt that platform, but there are a ton of gamers there and there are a ton of bellhop fans there. Uh, so not being able to share bit.ly links there hurts. I have had my account suspended three times in the last two, two to three months due to sharing stuff like bit.ly links. Yes, I realize it's Google. It's stupid. I, and I can't seem to convince them I'm not a bot. But that's why I'm not a huge fan of bit.ly. Like, I do like it. it. It's cool that it exists, but I would much rather just say youtube.com forward slash tabletop bellhop. Because everywhere else, we're forward slash tabletop bellhop. Why can't we have that at YouTube? If you, if you actually check the, uh, the, the end card of our YouTube, our newest YouTube videos, there's a, there's a theme going on because we really are tabletop bellhop everywhere else. Everywhere. Everywhere yep. else. It's the one place we can't do it. And I'll admit, I've been squatting that username for almost five years when I can't because it sounds awesome. Come on, Tabletop Bellhop. It's a great name. It's probably one of the best things I've ever come up with. Um, I, as soon as I came up with that name, I started registering for accounts everywhere because I didn't want someone to steal it. And if you do see a Tabletop Bellhop, it's not me. Please point it out. I should probably copyright it or something. Anyway, again, I'm off somewhere. I don't know what my problem is today. I'm not actually even on pain meds, so I don't know what it is. Um... Where am I at? 2019. So con appearances. So this year, NG Games and I are hoping to make appearances at three cons. We've actually already booked some of these. Awesome. One of the things that shows this is working is I am not paying to go to any of these cons, which is fantastic. People are recognizing uh, what we're doing here and want us there as guests or media, which is awesome. So we plan on being at Breakout Con in Toronto. That's at the end of March break. Origins Game Fair in Columbus, Ohio in June, and Queen City Conquest in Buffalo, New York, which is now moving to July. Now, I know Sean can't make Origins. Are you going to be able to make it to the other ones? Well, I'm definitely going to be making an appearance at Breakout. Uh, there's a uh, family uh, event that weekend that will uh, take up a little bit of time, but I'm going to see as much yeah. as as much as I can uh, to be there without uh, affecting important family 
Uh, as for QCC, I'm unfortunately less sure about that one. Yeah. Uh, the, the change in schedule is to a rather poor time for me. Um, so my, my day job tends to get a little busy at that point. Uh, school is out and my job, uh, we install, installing lighting tends to go full, full steam when the kids aren't in the schools and we, and all the construction right. companies are. So we'll, we'll, we're going to play that one by ear. Uh, hopefully you can make it out. I know it's hurting us too. Like July yeah. is really close to origins in June. That's not a lot of time for a yeah. budget refresh. That's, no, that's and, it's, and it's a shame because honestly, QCC was a, was a fantastic con. It was really enjoyable yeah. both uh, for the games and for the people, but yeah, you know. no, I agree. I, it'll be a shame. Like uh, we're hoping like this is the plan. Uh, yeah, that's the other issue is uh, Big G's birthday is in July. Now it, that is again before, but again, budget wise, right? Like that's kid's birthday. So uh, so those are the cons we're hoping to go to. Now, in the future, I would love to go to more cons. If you plan or organize a con and you would like the tabletop bellhop at your con, let me know. What I would love to do, I think we're probably a little too new for that, is I want to do a live show at a con. I want to have all three of us there sitting at a table, people there asking us questions, answering your game and game night questions live. I would love to see that happen. Uh, to me, I think that's a goal for 2020. But yep. if that happens in 2019, that'd be awesome. But I'm, I'm saving that for... A little far future. That's part of the five-year plan. There we go. So going forward, uh, oh, I basically just said that. Wow. See? Shows what I'm doing. So that's the other thing um, that would help us get to more cons is I would love to see a bunch more Patreon backers. Um, I, I appreciate every penny we're making from that. It is fantastic that we have backers. As I did note, this, this is now basically my full-time job. I do have other sources of income that are gaming related, but our Patreon does help pay for the show. Literally, um, you help us be able to do this. Now, speaking of the Patreon, NC Games and I are going to be completely reworking our rewards. Now, I don't know if they were wrong before and if that's why we don't have backers or not, but it's something we've been talking about for some time and something we want to get done early, like early 2019. Like maybe we'll do it between Christmas and New Year's to get it done. Um, we're going to be looking at new rewards. Uh, one of the things that I've seen a lot of other Patreons do that seems to be working really well and makes sense is that uh, rewards will accrue over time. So it doesn't matter what amount you pledge, but say you hit a threshold of say 20 bucks or 40 bucks over multiple months, you'll get something. So if you pledge a buck over 20 months, you'll get that reward. If you pledge five bucks, it's only going to take four months to get that reward. Now, the type of rewards we're looking at are things like personalized game recommendations, where you're like, hey, here is my list of two player abstract games and I'm looking for a new one. What don't I own? Right. Or I'm throwing a party this weekend and I got these people coming and these are the games I kind of like plan my game night right that kind of stuff stuff be able to use the information we know um the other thing is uh talking about gaming with us uh we play on board game arena there's no reason we couldn't play with you on board game arena and we'd maybe even be able to stream it which i think would be really cool uh, plus we're going to talk about streaming more games maybe there's a way you can somehow join in like an rpg through skype or something like that it's something we're going to be looking at now what i want to know is what would it take for those of you who aren't patrons of the show to get you to become patrons of the show? Uh, if that's just a matter of just keep putting out good content and if you dig it, you'll like us and you'll tip us, great. But is there something we could offer you that would be worth your hard-earned cash and a small dip into your gaming budget? Please let us know. Um, Mo at tabletopbellhop.com, questions at tabletopbellhop.com works. Hit me up on social media. I would love to know what we could offer you. You know, podcasting is in many ways easy. It's uh, the podcasting yeah. itself is a couple of people on a mic, um, but it's not free. Uh, and that's not even talking about the time it takes to, to put together this content and do the polish and the finish that we try to do for you. And, and that's not even considering all the blogging and the other content that's being created to, for you. Um, so, you know, just think about that. We're happy to produce things for you, but uh it does, it does take a toll. Yeah, like the show will always be free. I don't yeah. plan oh, on absolutely. putting up a pay gate. It's never going to be a point where you have to back our patron to get our content. Nope. Bonus content, yes, right? Like the after show, that's something different. The actual podcast is never going to cost you any money. We're not trying to hold anything hostage. We're not trying to – I guess we are trying to bribe you. Okay, yeah, we're trying to bribe you. <laughs> but we're not trying to hold anything hostage. Uh, we want to know what we can provide that would help um, – 
make it worth your while to support us. Yep. So one of the things we are going to do next year is re-record episode zero. We, back in the day, I'm like, by episode five, we'll have this nailed down and we need to have an episode zero and maybe I kind of jumped the gun. Uh, we probably recorded that too early. For one, just our quality, and two, we totally don't do what we say we do in episode zero. Like how we met, that part's all the same, but like we talked about our show format, that's changed. We even, I'm pretty sure we still say it, we record on Thursdays. Like it's, it's way off. Um, it's kind of a joke now and that needs to be fixed and we have tried to schedule re-recording this multiple times and it keeps falling through it's got to get done yep uh so sometime when we aren't in holidays or injured uh <laughs> perhaps we'll get to that uh so the other thing we are going to do in 2018 is and this was going to happen no matter whether i was tabletop bellhop or not is we're going to take part in extra life the thing is, we want it bigger, better than ever. This year, we raised over $7,000. That blows me away. In five years previous, we didn't raise $7,000 total. We raised as much in one weekend as we had five years previous. That is insane. $7,000 for the kids. Our goal for 2019, um, as the Windsor Gaming Resource, Tabletop Health, whatever, the local Windsor gamers are going to break $10,000. We're going to make this happen. Now, as part of that, we are going to get Sean down here in Windsor. We're going to do a better job streaming the whole thing. We're going to try to do some of the stuff you see other shows on Twitch do where you can donate, you can be involved, you can tip for us. We're going to try to figure all that out. Right now, I have no idea how to get that to work. As far as I can tell, you can't actually donate in Twitch, so I don't know how these other shows are doing it, but hopefully we'll figure it out because we want to make this a bigger deal. I would love to see... You, my viewers, my fans, joining our team. You don't have to be from Windsor. I don't know if I'm going to set up a separate tabletop bellhop team or if I'm still going to run the Windsor Gaming Resource. I'm going to run the Windsor Gaming Resource because the local gamers are already used to joining it. But I may do a tabletop bellhop team. I want to see you guys out. I want you guys gaming and streaming under our banner. Go out, buy a bell, put it on your game table, and say you're supporting us. I think that'd be awesome. We want to raise at least $10,000, and it'd be awesome if we killed that number. Yep. So I've got a few plans to step up the, the Extra Life stream. Uh, we need to work out a little bit about what's technically possible and, and work out with, uh, you know, whether Streamlabs or Twitch or however the donation is possible. But uh, I know what I'm looking at is really sort of turning this into more of an event. Uh, I've, been, I've been inspired by some of the Fortnite uh, cons and things like that, where I, I plan on being a commentator on the stream uh, quite oh, possibly. So, and, and so we'll be able to switch from games to me sitting there, you know, with my headset on there in the store commentating on what's going on. Uh, so this is, and again, yeah. So NG Games has mentioned, this is Extra Life, a, a worldwide nationwide charity for uh, mm -hmm. children's hospitals that, uh, that, that we're trying to benefit. The other thing that has already happened is assuming our venue is going to be the same. I can't see that changing unless like there's an explosion or something. Uh, they are now at fiber. It's done. Done deal. So internet Excellent. should not be an issue whatsoever. Excellent. Uh, that, that, that certainly is going to definitely make uh, yeah. some things more possible. So then, like, just general stuff for 2019. I, I want to do more live stuff. I want to be on Twitch more. As Sean noted, they're the people who get the Twitch followers are the ones that are here three days a week. Maybe I'll be here three days a week. I want to do more unboxings. I want to do some live plays. I want people... There might be a way for you to join us for game night, right? Like, I have my Monday night game night or my... Um, Friday night, my Friday night Gloomhaven night. Maybe I can set it up so you guys can be there while we're playing Gloomhaven. Even if it's just to watch, right? Like people dig that stuff. And I'm all for providing that kind of content. If I get a new game, I want you to see me open it and hear my thoughts as I do so. And then maybe join me when I get to get it to the table. The other thing I'm considering doing, which may or may not happen, is getting back into painting miniatures and streaming that. Um, like for example, stuff fables showed up under the tree this year. And I think painting those miniatures would be fantastic. Uh, we've got a lot of plans to generate content, uh, for you, but right now, uh, it's an expensive act of love. So that's sort of where we're at. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. At this point it is. So Sean, you have any plans for your side, technical side of the show, things you want to get done. Well, I know uh, a lot of what it is is just sort of tightening up that YouTube more, getting it closer to the, the 
podcast quality in its internal content. Uh, but we've also got some ideas. We've added the new uh, graphics at the top of the YouTube video. Yep. We've got the end card. And we're actually looking at adding two more videos based off of that same same content. And actually, so we'll have the full video if anyone wants to sit down and watch the full hour and a half or so content. Uh, but if you just want to hear about the Week in Review, we're hoping to break that off. So there'll be a separate uh, playlist for that. And then the question, the main you know meat of our uh, of the bellhops ideas will also be a separate uh, content and playlist. Uh, and I'm looking to have some uh, new little animations built up for those as well, all all on the same theme. Sounds good. It's going to be interesting for me to see what people watch more. Absolutely, it'll, it'll tell us what content people are appreciating. Everyone I've gotten feedback on is like, I like the whole thing. Keep it all. Don't split things up. Keep it all together. But YouTube, why not? Right? We yeah. can provide all three. Here's Absolutely. the full show. Here's the first part. Here's the second part. We can't do that here on Twitch, and we could do that with the audio show, but, man, that's going to really flood people's podcatchers. Absolutely. I think that's going to be annoying. Yeah. Now, maybe, depending on how the YouTube goes, it might be something we do change in the future. So as this episode's dropping on New Year's, I thought it'd be appropriate to end with any gaming resolutions we have. I know I have a couple. Uh, I've already started mine thanks to Christmas, but uh, I, I really just want to play more. <laughs> yeah. That's a legit one, right? Like, just play more games. That's a good one. I don't think I have to say that. With over 300 plays, I would like to play more games. Like, 300 sounds like a lot, but for me, that's not a lot for a year's worth of play. So, my first, I, we'll call it a resolution, my first challenge, there was a thing over at Board Game Geek. I don't know when it started. It's last five years or so, maybe longer. Maybe I only heard about it five years ago. Uh, every year, someone starts up a thing called the 10 by 10 challenge. Now, the goal of that is to pick 10 games in your collection and play them 10 times by the end of the year. Uh, this is an effort to play the games you own instead of always focusing on hot new games and possibly saving you money. It's also an attempt to deep dive a game, to actually sit down and play a game enough times to fully learn the game and obtain some mastery over the game. Now, you would think with almost 300 game plays in 2018, I'd be like, yeah, no problem. 10, 10 games, 10 times, it's going to happen. But this year, there's only six games out of all the games I played that I played at least 10 times. So it's harder than you would think. Uh, now, there are two sets of rules according to the Board Game Geek thread. You can set the hard mode as you pick your 10 games now. And then you have to play those 10 games. The easy mode is as the year comes, you can add games, remove games. You can start with a blank slate. You can pick one game, pick two. I'm going to be going for easy. There's no way I'm picking 10 games in January. And those are the games I know with it in, Feb in hell in February, I'll still want to play that may switch up. So mine, I plan on messing with. Yeah. The public aspect of your gaming is really what plays havoc with that, uh, that 10 and 10. You know, if you were, if it was yeah. just your game, your game crew sitting down on a regular basis, you could say, look, we're going to play this 10 times. Let's, let's all learn it. And, and you could all yeah. take part. But when you rarely know who you're playing with, other than a couple of nights a week, um, a lot of nights you're, you're playing with whoever's at, else is at the store or, or whatever. Yeah, I agree. Um, that is definitely part of it. The other part is just my groups, we're all adults. We're not steady, right? Like I could probably pick my Monday night group and go, we're going to play these 10 games 10 times. It might work. The problem is I'll pick four player games and we'll always have five players. Like that's just what happens with that group. We are supposed to be playing. Um, I don't even know. We were going to play edge of the empire. We were supposed to be, it's supposed to be an RPG group and all we play is board games because we never get a full group together to play RPGs. So yeah, the public play does hurt. I don't know. I, this time I'm going to dedicate more to it because part of it is now I have this platform. I'm going to have somewhere to talk about my 10 by 10. We're probably going to do a monthly post or a monthly, it'll be a topic on the podcast, right? Once a month, like, hey, how are you doing on your 10 by 10? By focusing on it, it's more likely to get done. I started doing it last year, and I remember Cry Havoc was the first game I wanted to play 10 times because it seemed like a game where mastery would really be rewarded, and I stalled out after about six games. And then with everything else going on during the year, especially launching this, like launching the Tabletop Bellhop was a lot of work. I realize it seems simple enough we're sitting talking about games, but at this point, we've got a bit of a flow, but just stuff like setting up the website, everything, took a lot of time. Um, I, it's, I, it's, a, it's a meme, right? But... Now that I don't have a day job, I actually work more. I spend way more hours doing this than I ever did working in the auto industry. I'm spending way too much time doing stuff for the bellhop. It's kind of nuts. 
But that's at least I'm doing something I love because, man, I hate the auto industry. <laughs> uh, so any resolutions for you? Uh, so other ones I want to do um, is I want to do something called RPG a month. So Roger Braslett started this on G plus a few years ago and I kind of took it over for him. Uh, he dropped out of it and I was really pushing it. Now, last year I pushed it heavy and went pretty good at it. This year I started at the beginning of the year, but like I said, with launching the bell hop, uh, it's, it was a lot more work than I thought it would be taking up a lot more of my time. And it's, I could do RPG a month, which is just something I like to do, or I could be doing this for the bell hop, which is now my job, right? So I focused on the job stuff. Um, so, but now that we're into a pretty regular schedule with, uh, with the show, um, when things are normal and there's no personal injuries, I tend to have stuff done ahead of time. Like the show notes are done by the weekend and Sundays I actually tend to have free. I could, I think I can work this in. So the goal of RPG a month is to read those books that are on your shelf that have been there forever and collect dust, right? And by shelf, I also mean your your PDF folder with 10,000 RPGs in it that you keep buying off drive through RPG but not reading. Although every RPG gamer does this. I don't know an RPG gamer that doesn't buy an excessive number of books that they never actually read. Uh, the same thing people do this with novels too. So all the goal is read one book a month, whether that's a 13-page module or a 600-page hardcover rule book. It doesn't matter. Just read one. Um, then talk about it, right? Use the hashtag RPG a month, go on Twitter, say I'm reading this, right? Talk about it, get people involved. I want to get more people doing it. My goal is to get those games off your shelf read. Cause I have a lot. It's like my pile of shame for board games, but it's way worse for RPGs. Uh, now, even if you don't have a wide collection, just keeping an eye on drive through RPG can score you some oh, yeah. free or dirt cheap ones that you can read. Uh, so getting 12, you know, and maybe they're only small little PDFs. You got to start somewhere. Um, they're there to have. I know I've got uh, a few back there that uh, that I haven't gotten to, and I've probably had this yeah. sitting on my shelf for many years. <laughs> yep, it happens to everyone. I don't know. It's it, we're all collectors or something. So uh, this is similar to, like I said, with the 10, 10 by 10. I plan on tying RPG a month in with the blog. Right? It's going to be part of Tabletop Bellhop. So I haven't decided when I was doing this on Google Plus, I would post like whenever I would sit down and read a couple chapters, I do have a pretty detailed review of those chapters. I may do it that way or I may just do a monthly. Hey, this month, here's the book I read. Here's a review. I haven't decided which way it's going to go. What I would like to do is also follow it up with an actual play. So if all the cards fall in my Monday night group gets bed together more often, I'm not only going to read an RPG book a month, I'm going to try to use those books and like tell you give an actual play review of them as well the whole point though is just get the books read right like get use out of the stuff i spent my money on it just makes sense right it, it's the bellhops law it's the rpg version the the best rpg in your collection are the books that actually get read as opposed to the ones collecting dust so we want to read our books put some use into it and i hope other people are willing to join in on this like there's not going to be a sign up page just if you want to take part take part and so tabletop, just to point out, does mean more than just board games. We don't talk yeah. a lot about RPGs. There's a lot of different uh, podcasts and Twitch streams out there that, that deal with that focused. But uh, we we are gamers and, and part of that is RPG games. And so, you know, we're not going to leave that out. Oh, exactly. Tabletops, RPGs, miniatures, card games, dice games, pretty much any game doesn't even require a tabletop we are also all about larps though i don't personally play them and as far as i know sean doesn't play them but we'll talk larps if you ask me a larp question i'll try to find a larp expert to answer it for you because it wouldn't be me but i have no problem any type of gaming uh just really we're not too big into sports yes i know their games we did talk uh, ping pong for a while there i yes, didn't get did. a new ping pong paddle yet yeah. so my final resolution of the year is going to be to reduce my piles of shame. I know I say this every year. Now at the start of 2018 or end of 2017, I actually like reorganized my piles of shame. So they were in a certain order where the oldest games were on the bottom and all this. And I was like, if this chair is empty by the end of the year, I've won, right? Well, the problem is we rearranged the game room since then and that got all mixed up. Plus again, I got busy. We launched the tabletop bellhop. We launched a website. We started streaming. We bought new tech. We upgraded our internet. Uh, the, 
my household's still kind of turned upside down since my mom moved in, right? Like nothing's quite normal yet. Uh, we were busy. I, it fell apart. I did not do a good job at reducing the pile of shame. Yes, I got two games off it yesterday. I will admit by the end of the year, I think it's lower than it started at the beginning of the year, but I couldn't quantify that. So what I want to do this year is actually try to quantify it. I, I'm going to somehow, I don't know if it's going to be using Board Game Geek or what, I'm going to go downstairs, make a list, all the games I haven't played, and I'm going to actually try to get those games played. Much to end she games uh, chagrin because she would much rather play games she knows. I'm going to try to get people to play these games that have sat on my shelf far too long. Now, what I'm thinking is I want to talk about it, right? So same deal. If I talk about it on the blog, I'm holding myself accountable, and you guys can hold me accountable going, hey, how's it going? So I'm thinking at this point it's probably just going to be a once of a month thing where I talk about what games came off my pile of shame and provide a short review, right? So it's going to be, you know what? This month I got six games off my pile of shame. It's these six. Here's my thoughts on those six games. It's something I used to do at the WGR. It seemed to be going pretty well, um, and people seemed to dig it, so... Yeah, it's amazing when you look back at the old WGR content and, and how things have really have been heading to this point for a yeah. very long time. Yes. Um, it 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 <laughs> took took longer than some of us may have wished, but we're here, and and that's good for everyone. Yeah, no, it was like definitely a lot of what I was doing then was leading towards this, and a lot of what I'm doing now has the basis of what I did then. So that's that's basically it, right? More gaming, more content, content that looks better. That's what I want out of 2019. So that was our look back, followed by our look forward. For more gaming content, including reviews, game, and game night advice, be sure to check out the blog at tabletopbellhop.com. Uh, send us your questions over on the website under Ask the Bellhop, or email us at questions at tabletopbellhop.com. Now, Patreon patrons at the good tip or better level do get their questions bumped to the top of our list. Speaking of our Patreon, a shout out and a thank you to our backers. Their support helps make this show possible. Misdirected Mark, join Phil, Chris, and Bob every Tuesday night at 8.40 Eastern as they talk games and game mastering. That's 8.45 Eastern. Uh, Brian Kurtz, it's been a while since we've seen you on the show. Hope things are going well. Graham Barnett, thank you. Joe Swick, thanks. Steve D, thanks for stopping in and thanks for your support. Jeff Seuss, thank you. Saw you stick your head in earlier. And William Fisher, our latest patron, thank you for backing the show. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift's coming to an end and we're going to have to lock the front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us across the web at tabletopbellhop.com, one word. Or drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. If you like the content we're providing and would like to help support our continued efforts, please consider tipping the bellhop at patreon.com forward slash tabletopbellhop. Remember to join us here on Twitch every Wednesday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern and watch for the Tabletop Bellhop live to hit your podcatchers and YouTube at Tuesday at 2 a.m. Eastern every week. Well, that about wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thank you for joining us. We'd like to invite you to hang around and join us in the Pando Suite for an Off the Books After Show. For Tabletop Bellhop Live, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you, and game on.